We good, Pam? Okay. I now see Amherst Media and other people are starting to trickle in. We are recording. I've also made you and Mandy co-hosts. I believe okay. Nate Malloy is also a co-host. Um, and if I haven't done that yet, I will be doing that. But yes, you are good to go. We are, we are live and we're recording. All right. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the planning, uh, Amherst Planning Board meeting of July 21st, 2021. My name is Jack Jemsek, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken. Uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this planning board meeting, uh, which is also a, going to be uh, jointly held with the uh, uh, community Resource uh, Committee from the Town Council um, uh, will be conducted via remote means using uh, the Zoom platform. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so following the link shown on the slide. This link is also available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting. Or go to the Planning Board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public will be permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can be adequately, uh, can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for the reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post on the town of Amherst uh, website an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. Board members, I will take a roll call when I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then uh, place yourselves back on mute. Uh, so we know Mary Chow is not here, so she is a, an excused absence. I'm here. Uh, Tom Long, please. Here. Andrew McDougall. Present. Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Present. Johanna Newman. Present. Great. So board members, if technical issues arise, let Pam know if necessary, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will be, uh, note if this happened. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, um, remember to remute yourself. And this applies to when uh, uh, Mandy uh, will be chairing the joint hearings here, so it applies. Um, opportunity for public comment will be provided during the, the general public comment period and is reserved for comments regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Public comment may also be heard at other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general, general public comment period. Please indicate if you, uh, if you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button. When public comment is solicited, if you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views and uh, for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair or the CRC, uh, Chair uh, Mandy, uh, if a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participants, participation, sorry, will be disconnected from the meeting. So at this time, we, we would like uh, the planning board, before we um, uh, initiate the joint hearing, uh, we'd like to review the minutes of the June 2nd meeting. And are there any comments on the board uh, in that regard. Um, uh, do you see any, or anybody make a motion with regard to accepting these minutes? Uh, Doug? Move we accept the minutes. Okay, and a second, Andrew? A second. Okay, uh, any discussion? I see none. Do a quick roll call here. Um, uh, Tom? 
Approved. Andrew? Aye. And Doug? Accept. Janet? Um, I'm going to abstain because I wasn't at the meeting. Okay. Uh, Johanna? Approve. And I'll approve as well. So those accepted, what, five, zero, one abstination there. And this next item, uh, public comment. Prior to this planning board uh, joint uh, meeting with the CRC, I see one hand raised, Pam Rooney. Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Um, Thank, yeah, name and address, please. Thank you. 42 Cottage Street, a general conversation or point of, point of um, I guess, order. When these amendments are being discussed, it would be very, very helpful to have the proposed wording in front of folks so that uh, it's clear what's being tracked and what's being discussed, um, as not everybody has access to probably the the latest and greatest versions of these. I think there's been some confusion about which is the latest version of different amendments. So that'd be very helpful to have that up in, um, in writing. And just secondly, um, it's stated all the time that there won't be any response to public comments made on different topics during the discussions. But in fact, that feels like if someone has the information to respond to a public comment, it would be very appropriate to have that person respond to a public comment. So I think arbitrarily, you know, cutting off that kind of dialogue is not helpful. Thank you. Yeah, Pam, just to direct, I, I think this is, that only applies to this public comment period here. I think during, you know, individual projects and during hearings, we, we, we will definitely respond. I, I think that's a, um, sorry for the misunderstanding there, but we're not, uh, uh, that, that, that was reserved for this general period that doesn't apply to anything that we're speaking, uh, uh, that's on the agenda for this evening. So at that point, um, I think I can turn it over to Mandy. Yep. So thank you. Um, at 6.40 p.m., seeing a presence of a quorum of the Community Resources Committee, I will call the meeting to order for this June 21st meeting. Jack has gone through the whole legal statements about remote meetings, so I will not re restate all of that. Um, and with that, I'm gonna take a roll call of our members. Mandy is here, Dorothy. Present. Shalini. Here. And Evan. Here. Steve Schreiber will not be present tonight. Um, so we have one member missing there too. And um, with that, we're gonna get right into, Jack has passed the chairing of all of the public hearings for tonight to me. Um, so I'm going to get into some of that. I want to acknowledge that we've received um, a lot, the, the planning department, um, planning board and CRC has received a number of um, public comments um, and emails throughout the day today. And we thank you for sending your thoughts to us um, throughout the day and all. And we just want to say in the future, it's very helpful if we get them as early as possible, preferably 24 hours in advance, um, so that we can ensure that all members have received them in a timely manner and that we all have sufficient time to read and consider them. We recognize that that's not always possible, but it is much preferable. The sooner we can get them, the better it is for us to really consider them and think about them as we're, we're doing all of this. And so with that, um, I will at 6.42 PM, in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing of the Amherst Planning Board and the Community Resources Committee of the Amherst Town Council has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendment to the zoning bylaw. Zoning bylaw Article 3, Use Regulations, Section 3.323, Apartments and Article 12, Definitions. 
to see if the town will vote to amend section 12 definitions of the zoning bylaw to revise the definition of apartments by removing the limit on the maximum number of dwelling units per building to amend section 3.323 to change the permitting requirement for apartments from special permit to site plan review in the residential village center RVC district and from site plan review to special permit in the general business BG district to modify the requirement regarding size and bedroom count of units to require that enclosed parking on the first or ground floor be located at the rear of the building and designed to reduce visibility from the public way and to require that the principles and standards of the design review board be applied to all new apartment buildings. We will be going through the same general procedure for public um, for the public hearing for each of these. So I will go through it now that the public hearing has been opened. Um, we will start and I'll go through the whole procedure this time and I'll briefly describe it this time and then I'll just remind people as the next three hearings come up. We'll start with board and committee member disclosures, then we'll have a presentation from the planning staff, then we will receive questions from the boards and committee members. That portion I will try to limit a little bit of time so that we can move to questions from the public and um, comments from the public sooner rather than later but we will be able to get some questions in before we move to it. After questions from the board, we will move to questions from the public. And those two question periods are only for questions, not for deliberation, not for statements about support or non-support. Um, after that, public speaking in favor of the revision will be recognized, and then public speaking in opposition of the revision will be recognized. And then we'll hear from the planning staff again if they have any other comments, and then we'll receive questions from the board or committee. Um, we have four to get through tonight, so it's going to be um, potential that these hearings may or may not be closed. They may be continued after we've received the second and heard second set of questions from the board or committee. Um, the planning board, I'll be looking for a motion from the planning board members on whether they want to either close or continue a hearing. If the motion is going to be continue, I would ask that we as a joint committees discuss dates so that we can continue to the same date and make sure we'll have quorums available for those dates. Um, and then once that's happened, any motion after the planning board, a motion will be by CRC for the same thing. And then um, we will move on to the next hearing. Are there, to begin with, are there any questions regarding the procedure before we move to disclosures? I see Janet. Um, thank you. I was wondering, um, is it, is it possible that the planning board might decide to continue the public hearing and the CRC feels like they're ready to close it? Um, are we are we in lot, you know, as you know, because there's, there's been li different levels of scrutiny and timing on these different amendments. That is always possible. It, um, it, it would come up depending on whether that happens. So I won't say it's not possible, but we did notice this as a joint hearing. So in theory, we should continue the hearing jointly or close it jointly, but it is probably technically possible that the two boards could decide different things. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other questions, we're going to move to board and committee member disclosures. Are there any? Seeing none, we will recognize um, Chris Brestrup and the rest of the planning department. I'm not sure who is doing which presentations tonight. So Chris, just identify which one, who's gonna do it from the, your department. I'd like to introduce Maureen Pollock, planner in our department, and she will talk to you about apartments. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Maureen. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, let me share my screen, just one moment. So I am going to, uh, let's see here, view full screen, here we go. So um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for tonight's opportunity. I will be uh, talking to you about the zoning amendment proposal for uh, apartments uh, under section 3.323. Uh, and first I'll just go through um, what's existing in the zoning bylaw. There is an existing definition which uh, say, uh, states that a residential use uh, consisting of one or more buildings in each building containing no fewer than three no, and no more than 24 units. Um, the existing standards and conditions uh, um, outline where the apartment development can be located. It's on a uh, site uh, with one or more buildings um, and that it needs to be located close to a heavily traveled street or streets, close to a business, commercial, 
or educational district or in an area already developed for multifamily use. Um, continuing, um, it needs to be uh, connected to sewer. It needs to meet the dimensional regulations. There are special uh, provisions for the neighborhood business zoning district. Uh, the bedroom count, there's uh, no more than 50% of the total number of dwelling units can be of one size. And the, uh, an apartment development needs to apply with the design review principles and standards. Um, this slide just outlines uh, where apartments are allowed uh, by zoning districts, and I added uh, uh, as a comparison where mixed use uh, buildings are allowed. Um, and uh, and I um, so in the village center, uh, it is by special permit, and we're proposing it uh, to be changed to site plan review um, since it's um, the village center residence zoning district. It, it would um, the words itself is is um, indicating that that's where we would like to uh, encourage more uh, residential uses. It's a lot, uh, in the general residence, it's allowed by special permit. In the limited business district, it's allowed by special permit. In the village center business, it's allowed by special permit. In the neighborhood business district, it's allowed by special permit. Um, currently, it's by site plan review in the B, in the general business district, and uh, we're proposing that it would be allowed by special permit. Um, our proposed zoning amendment uh, changes um, in, um, is to remove the maximum number of units allowed per building, opposed to having a max of 24 units per building. Um, update standards and conditions regarding uh, diversifying. Uh, the bedroom count for uh, 10 or more units. Um, and so basically, if there are 10, 10 or more units, um, they would have to have um, uh, uh, more than 50% of those units would have to have a different bedroom count. Um, uh, there's a provision about enclosed uh, parking that would have to be in the rear of the, of the building, and it couldn't be visible from the public right away. And as I already uh, showed in the previous slide, uh, we're proposing a different permitting path for apartments for two districts, uh, one being in the general business would be allowed by special permit. And then in the village center residence, it would be allowed by site plan review. And so uh, I wanna talk about um, taking the cap off um, for apartments in, in, in each of the districts. Um, I took a closer look at table three, the dimensional regulations. And after analyzing table three, um, I, we have concluded that taking the cap off apartments and allowing more than 24 units per building is really only useful in the general business district and the village center um, business district. Um, and for the other zoning districts, it is difficult, if not impossible, to get 24 units in a building given the existing dimensional regulations. Therefore, list, lifting that cap isn't useful in the BL, the RG, and the BN. Um, and so table three, again, um, and so I guess I should have said this first. So um, the different colors, if you see a color that, color that means it's allowed in that district. So, um, uh, so here in the RVC, um, you know, the lot, lot uh, basic uh, minimum lot area and the additional lot area per family um, really, um, it, uh, is um, a safeguard from adding perhaps more density than folks may or may not want. And you can see that for the other sort of blue highlighted uh, districts, um, uh, RG, BL, and BN. And then in the um, columns that are highlighted in red, that's the BG and then the BVC. And so in, in those districts, footnote B applies for them. And so uh, uh, apartments are, uh, permitted in, the, in those districts um, the, and under footnote B, the basic minimum lot area, additional lot area per family and the minimum lot frontage um, is not required uh, for apartments. Um, and so with our, uh, I, I, um, there was a request um, from a member, uh, I believe from last week's meeting asking for to see examples of, uh, of a couple build outs um, so we're providing two examples in the general business district. Um, both are along North Pleasant Street. Um, and so we'll just dive right into it. So example one, um, let's see here. Um, example one is, I'll um, try to 
orient everyone. Uh, so this is the post office. Um, this would be, uh, um, I guess the location perhaps does, doesn't matter in our sort of pretend scenario, but maybe it does. Okay, so anyways, this is uh, Ren's gas station and this is a vacant lot. Uh, you, the leader uh, building used to be located and I believe it's been demolished. Um, if those lots were combined, it would be about 0 0.880 acres or 35,000 square feet. And the maximum build out for that is about 90 uh, units total, um, solely just based on table three regulations. Um, and this is showing the that build out. Um, it's showing the footprint, the building footprint. Um, this would be a five story building. Um, the setback and um, the bedroom count would vary um, throughout the building because there would be 10 or more units total. Um, and uh, the building coverage, so the maximum building coverage in, in, in the um, BG is 70, but we wanted to provide um, you know, uh, some uh, courtyard and, and more um, landscaping. So we reduced it to 60%. Um, and in the next slide, I'll show you, uh, walk you through just the setbacks. Um, A would be, um, so the, let's see here. Um, we wanted to be consistent with um, the front setback with the post office. So we were responding to that to be consistent. Um, B represents uh, the 10 foot setback, um, which is consistent along the north side of this mock development. Um, C represents uh, the setback is actually increased to 20% if it abuts a residential district, which is the RG. So that's represented here. And uh, although this part would go back to 10 feet, um, neighbors already spoke to me and said they want 20 feet. So that's why I put that. And then D, um, this is the uh, uh, courtyard space. Um, and uh, that would be roughly about a uh, thousand square feet. And I didn't put walkways or anything on that or anything. So this is just a very rough concept. Uh, you know, there would, I would assume there would be trees along here and fencing and, and who knows uh, what else, but um, that would give you a rough idea of a, of a maximum build out. And then an example two is also in the BG um, zoning district here um, is um, this parcel here where the black star is, is where um, the typewriter shop is and where the white star is, is where the Knights of Columbus building is located. And so this parcel as a parcel is uh, about 7,400 square feet. The maximum build out for this um, would allow up to roughly 25 units could be provided based solely on table three regulations. And um, so this would be the maximum building coverage would be 5,189 square feet. So um, the, the footprint, the maximum footprint would be that size. Um, and that would be, um, a, you know, in this mock development, it would be five stories. Um, and um, I can um, walk you through the language, um, which is sort of just a repeat of what I showed you, but um, it nothing has changed since mm, the June 28th town council meeting um, from, yeah, from a couple weeks ago. Um, so uh, green, uh, uh, text in green represents proposed, text with red with a strike through represents it being removed. And so we're um, proposing to remove the cap uh, for, for uh, apartment buildings per building um, in each, uh, the permit path would change in the RVC to special permit review and by special permit in the BG. Um, that just repeat, uh, the bedroom count um, is talking about um, that if, if there is um, more than 10, 10, uh, 10 units or more, there would need to be uh, no more than 50% of the total number of dwelling units um, Maureen, yeah. I, just, I, I don't want to interrupt, but um, if you were trying to share the screen, we don't see it. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You know what? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't, thank I you. Interrupt. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, everyone. We just don't see the language. There it's it is. Sorry. Sorry. I, um, it was the way I shared the screen. Thank you, Nate, for speaking up. 
Um, so you heard me, so I, I don't feel like I need to back up. And then the, um, I think the last provision uh, change would be uh, for the enclosed parking would be um, parking on the first or ground floor shall be at the rear of the building and designed to reduce visibility from the public way or walkways in areas customarily used by pedestrians and the public. And just to back up for the management plan, um, the management plan, while we're um, recommending it just to be removed from this section, largely just to reduce the size of the zoning bylaw, it is a requirement of um, the all um, uh, ZBA and, and planning board applications, and it is um, it is uh, stated in the ZBA rules and regulations, and I believe the planning board rules and regulations. Um, so this is kind of just a redundancy. So we're just so we're just cleaning it up, um, and that's that's all I got. Thank you, Maureen. Um, Chris, you raised your hand. Did you have a comment before we move on to questions from the boards and committees? I think it would be helpful if Maureen went through the language with the image on the screen. Sorry. Because, Sorry. Um, yeah, sure. That would make sense. Follow with the disconnect. So if you would indulge her for a little while longer, that would sure. be good. Sorry, and thank you, and sorry about that again. So to get back to the proposal, uh, nothing's changed from the June 28th revision to the town council. Um, the definition, um, proposed definition change would, uh, would uh, be regarding uh, removing the cap of amount of dwelling units per building. Um, the permit path uh, would change uh, for the RVC from special permit to uh, site plan review and then in the BG it would be um, changed uh, from site plan review to special permit and this is uh, just a repeat of removing the cap um, of 24 units um, and the bed and then I think that's when Nate chimed in <laughs> but we can um, so this is saying if there's more than 10 units in a building that they would have to diversify the amount of, built, of bedroom counts. So it couldn't just be, um, you know, one, just one bedroom building. It would have to have a mix of different single, uh, different variety. And then again, the enclosed parking, uh, parking on the first and ground floor shall be at the rear of the building and designed to reduce the visibility from the public way or walkways in areas customarily used by pedestrians in the public. And then, as I said moments ago, the management plan um, is stated in, in various other documents. So we wanted just to clean this up and uh, reduce the redundancy. Thank you, Maureen. We are now gonna move on to questions from board and committee members. Again, this is a question time, not a deliberation time. So we're gonna start with um, Janet. Um, so I, I kind of lost the thread when you were showing the first example. Um, of Wren's um, gas station. And so, um, so is 90 units the result after the apartment's definitions change or is it, what, what would be the result under the current zoning versus um, the change in the apartment definition without the cap? Is the, is the cap one building with 24 units or three buildings with 24 units? I mean, how many units could be built on that site? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so uh, so currently, um, you know, if, if someone were to develop it today, they would have a cap of 24 units per building. So, I mean, it doesn't mean, um, so maybe if, 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 if they're able to fit in a few buildings, on that property, um, I don't know what number that would be. It might be, I would assume, less than 90 units, um, but maybe not. Um, I don't know. If, um, so that 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 would be the real difference. Is that if if um, someone were to build it, they would have to they would have to be multiple buildings, opposed to having one building that would allow 90 units. Um, and then, was there is there an example for the RVC? Um, so I was going to do that, um, but since the lot, the parcels in the RVC are very small, um, mm -hmm. th that they never go over 24 units, um, that I, I figured 
uh, it would probably, with my limited time, uh, I I wanted to solely just focus in the in the BG for ten, at least for tonight. But I I could in the future. Yeah, I, I'm not. I I know you have very little limited time. I feel quite the same way, and I'm sure you feel ten times more that way. So, so. I just, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to understand. So you, this change in definition will only have an impact in the BG with, under the, under our current zoning with only changing the definition. Is that Correct. So the BG and the BVC and- um, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I had RVC. I meant, okay. Yep. And, and that too. So, so just to say, to back up to the RVC, uh, table three dimensional regulations, mm -hmm. um, the, those have safeguards to our, what did we, we said RVC. So the basic, basic minimum lot area required in the RVC is 15,000 square feet and the additional lot area would be 4,000 square feet. Um, so with that and the, the very limited amount of parcels in the RVC, um, which um, would be there would be very little impact, if at all, to be honest. Okay, so, so but, but as I said before, the two zones that there could be impact would be the BG and the BVC. Um, and uh, Okay. Yep. And then do we have examples of what the impact would be in the BVC? So again, similar to the RVC, not to kind of be confusing, um, the, the part there is a very limited amount of parcels in the BVC, and they're very uh, small. Um, and a, there's a small amount of parcels, and they're small on the smaller end. So there would be uh, um, not as much opportunity um, for uh, development um, more than 24 units per building or per property. Okay. Um, um, Janet, can we go on to others and oh sure, sure, so that others can ask their questions. We can always come back to you, um, Jack. Yeah, my my only question was the dimensional table. I did not see that in our package. And I was wondering if we could cast our eyes on that for just you know thirty seconds, a minute longer. Yeah, sorry about that. And we'll um, if if today's uh, presentation hasn't been emailed to you all, uh, which was finished today. Um, We'll certainly uh, provide that tomorrow. Uh, the build outs were something done in the last 24 hours. So, okay, so we'll, uh, and then I decided I'm a visual person. Some of you all are visual people. So I, I like yeah. to have st stuff in front of me. So that's why I put this in here. Yeah, th that's good. I mean, I just, I was two thirds of the way through it. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Yeah. And just as a um, comment about, you know, the BBC and the BG, um, the, you know, the BG is our downtown. Uh, the BBC is one of our villa centers. Um, and those are areas that we do want to add more infill. Um, and so those are where um, the, if the cap of amount of units per building was removed, there could you know, be um, some impact of seeing more apartments. And then uh, and then just in general, um, the apartments are, you know, solely only allowed in village centers and um, in, in the downtown. Um, so they're not in outlying districts or anything like that. It's in our walkable downtowns and um, along bus routes or, or, or close to bus routes. Um, and so those are areas that uh, I believe the town would like to add more residential infill. Uh, thank you, Maureen, but it was only up there for a flash. And I'm oh, just wondering oh, oh you still wanted it. Oh, sorry. I, oh, I just, yeah, I was up there for like a couple of seconds. Can so it just we could leave it up there for a while. Oh, sure. because, yeah. Just leave up yeah. the screen share and, and we'll yeah. move on to other questions while people can look at that. Um, yeah. Dorothy. Mm. So Maureen is um, clarifying some things for me. Uh, one is this is not really an apartments zoning amendment. It is an apartments in B area zoning amendment. It doesn't seem to pertain to any uh, area that has an R in it. Is that correct, Maureen? Yeah, that's, that would be correct. 
Okay. It's a B and a B. Yep. Okay. So uh, I guess part of me finds it a little bit strange that in the business area, you're going to have the most intense residential. But um, uh, I looked at the um, written document that we received uh, from Paul on apartments and found that in the 1980s um, zoning amendment, it talked, had some words that I really loved listening to, reading, um, minimum landscaped or natural open space, <clears throat> which include those portions of the lot devoted to plantings, including lawns and grass areas, wooded land, pedestrian oriented, paved or unpaved areas, devoted to social or recreational use in common by the residents of the building or complex, provided that such areas are kept essentially open to the out of doors and our ground level. And I hadn't seen that group of words before, and that's kind of what I've been asking for uh, for a long time. So um, I gather that that's not going to apply to these, uh, this particular uh, apartment for the business zone that you're doing. There is um, no um, you rec area devoted to social or recreational use in common by the residents of the building or complex. Is, is, is that correct? Well, I, I, as uh, you know, both the planning board and the zoning board of appeals um, need to make findings under either 10.38 and 11.24 that get into whether uh, that you know, the development needs to provide adequate recreational or open space uh, for that development in that zoning district. So let's see here. So in this example here, mm -hmm. um, you know, this would be a courtyard uh, that would have, you know, b benches and, la and landscaping um, that is maybe, you know, a couple times larger than a another proposed development in town. Um, and uh, this is, um, what is this? Uh, this uh, foot, uh, uh, front setback is 25 feet mm -hmm. in depth and about 100 feet in, in width. So this, uh, would activate the streetscape um, and make it a friend friendly experience for transitioning um, from the development to the public right of way. Um, and so again, it would be up to the board uh, at hand um, to make those findings um, and to say, hey, um, this courtyard D here that's labeled as D, if that's not, if they seem that that is not adequate or sufficient to that development, then it it would be um, to, the, to the discretionary power of that board to negotiate with the developer during that public hearing process. Right, well, so that, those front areas seem to be what people have been asking for in terms of pedestrian and the people of the town areas, but not necessarily people who live in the building. Um, somebody said to me that if you kept the apartment number units limited, you're, you would be allowed to put two buildings, each of which would have 24. And then maybe, for example, there'd be in the middle, I just put my finger there thinking you could see mm -hmm. it. Uh, in the middle between that area there, that could be green and courtyard, and that would be more you know, oriented towards the residents of the building. Um, it, it's just that I am having a, a, a deep concern about people with children. Um, these seem to be you want a lot of new apartments in the downtown, but none of them seem to be appropriate for families or people with children. And that does bother me. So um, in some ways, I guess I'd like it not to, 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 to raise the cap. Um, because if you had two buildings there, it could be really nice. You'd have fewer units, but it would be, you know, to my mind, a better development. Thank you, Dorothy. Doug. Yeah, I had one minor question for Maureen, which is on the section that's entitled enclosed parking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you would be willing to change the word reduce to the word minimize. Sure. Uh, because I think, I think reduce is a difficult word to use in this location because you're going from a condition, you know, it's a new condition being designed so we're, we're, we're reducing in, in comparison to what? So I think the word minimize might be more uh, ap applicable in that situation. Okay. That's, my only, that's my only comment. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one question and then we're going to, since I see no other hands, we're gonna move on to questions from the public. And that is in the build out you showed, um, you seem to have 10 foot setbacks on the side and a 20 foot setback on the rear, which is I think what's required on the dimensional tables, but the apartment, the bylaw has this additional side rear yard per floor of two feet. So wouldn't that require um, on a five story building, 20 foot side setbacks, not 10, um, and then 30 foot in the rear? Or am I reading that wrong? Ooh, and if, uh, uh, how would that reduce the building coverage for the number of apartments? And would that, And so one question is, did I read that wrong so that this build out is or is not potentially accurate? Um, Cause I'm still trying to identify that. But the next question is that additional side rear yard setback is not required for mixed use. So would that potentially still imply that a developer might use the mixed use bylaw over the apartment bylaw in the BG? Excellent questions. Uh, and you just made me think of like, oh, did I mess that up? And I just turned to my handy draft language in front of me. And uh, we do have this provision about additional side, uh, side and rear yard setbacks per family. And those are applicable in, in the following zoning districts, uh, which is R, RG, BL, BBC, and BN. Um, so that would not be applicable in, in this build out because it's located in the in the BG. Um, but uh, that's great to, as a reminder um, to point that out to folks. And then the other question I think you had, Mandy, was about, um, about additional uh, uh, side and rear uh, setbacks if it abuts uh, a residential zoning district. Is that correct? No, I'm just trying to figure out, um, the question was related to those side rears. What what in this are, are we setting ourselves up for um, in this making it a special permit? I know mixed use buildings in BG are site plan review, but are we setting ourselves up for ending up without retail in a lot of our business general district because it's easier now to get the only apartment buildings, even though they're special permits. Um, and what kind of concern do we have about that? Uh, yeah, that's that's a good, uh, valid question. And, you know, so we are proposing to um, switch the permit path from site plan review uh, to special permit, um, which so it, it, it's a discretion of, of whether the, that particular use is appropriate in that um, neighborhood or, you know, block. Um, and, and so, you know, if the Zoning Board of Appeals feels that there's too many apartments going in, um, you know, either uh, in regards of time span or perhaps in relation to there's a apartment building on this block, we don't need another one. Um, they could have uh, the discretion to deny uh, a permit as it fits in uh, to their findings under 10.38. Okay. Thank you, Maureen. Janet, last question before we move to the public. So um, I, I have really so many questions. Um, so one thing I'd like to do is see um, drawings of full build out in all the relevant districts and then to see that in 3D, because I mean, we know that the developers are trying to maximize income, you know, of course, and the number of units. And so it would be useful to see what could be built under the current zoning in the BVC and the BG, and then what does maximum build out look like? Because we know, like, I love the 25 foot setback from the street, but I know it's a zero setback. And what would that look like um, at five stories? And then I love the idea of the thousand square foot courtyard um, I know we're looking at a building that has like a 250 square foot courtyard. And so I would like to see not just like an optimistic, what we think would be great, but really what could be there, like under the current zoning versus now. And, you know, of course, the worst case, because there's always a better case, but that's, you know, what I, I kind of want to know what I, I'm voting on. And I think most people would. Um, so that's my request. And then I, I still am like back in, you know, where I have asked this question in two previous meetings is, what was the reason for the 25 units per building? And so we've speculated it and we've talked about it. It seemed like, you know, for, you know, a town that's semi-rural, that's, you know, we want to keep our small town vibe. 
it was small scale apartments that are kind of more livable for tenants and nothing's too big. You know, you can see that at green leaves or different apartment complexes, there's green space, there's parking, there's not too many people in your building, you're not living, you know, whatever. But I, I, we're all making this up. And so I'm still waiting to hear from why did town meeting make this change and what was the vision of it? Um, the other question, I just have so many questions. Um, so I also wondered what Mandy Jo Haneke was, Mandy Jo was talking about, which is, you know, what are the impacts of this? Like, it, is it gonna skew towards apartment buildings and away from mixed use? Um, if we require 40% or 60%, um, you know, business uses on the first floor of mixed use and the apartments, you can just fill up with apartments with that limit. Um, you could consolidate lots and build a really big building, right? And we know that downtown, there's many small lots and many of them are owned by the same person. And so, you know, is that going to skew towards apartments downtown, which is fundamentally a business di district? Um, we'd like to balance that. And so we're like the impacts analysis the planning department went through, what are the possible consequences? Um, and, and I just want to, you know, I, I can think of them and I, I could go through them all. I mean, so those, those are my questions. Can, can we see what compare, what can be built now versus what could be built in the future, find out what the purpose behind the 24 units. I'm also wondering if the planning board looked at a larger unit count, but that also capped, you know, at less than 90 or hundred or 200, depending on how you, um, you know, combine your lots. And then also, you know, what was the impacts analysis? Has anyone said it could, this could happen, this could happen, this, has anyone done that analysis and what, what was the result of it? Well, I, and, I can answer some of your questions uh, about doing a build out per zone. Um, I did carefully look and analyze every zoning district that allows apartments parcel by parcel and, um, the majority of parcels um, in all the zoning districts besides um, the BG in the, in the, sorry, BG and the BVC uh, would have a little to no impact if the cap is removed. Firstly, because of uh, the safeguards provided by table three, but also by the limiting size of each lot um, they, they would on, on average need to have about two and a half acres to, um, to get over that bump of, of 24 units uh, per building. Um, so we're seeing lots of lots that are, you know, half acre, three fourths of a, an acre, um, and those um, don't allow um, the utilization of, of, of the cap removal. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to questions from the public now. And again, this is time for questions. Um, we will, after those are done, get to public speaking in favor and then public speaking in opposition. Um, so um, Pam Rooney, I think, Pam, you're going to control the not Pam Rooney. Um, <laughs> Pam, you'll control the, the allowing to talk. I certainly, well, you mean the timer? No, um, no, just just unmuting. Okay. Can I you can do that? do that. Yep, I can. Um, and if do you think you can do the timer too? Um, probably. Is uh -huh. is Nate? Are you with us? I am. I'll, yeah. I'll time. Oh, okay. I I can do the timer. And Nate, how about if you control when people talk? talk. Sure. Okay. So Thank Mandy, you. Mandy Joe, can I just ask you, are we doing three minutes, two minutes? Um, we're going to do three minutes at this point. Okay. For this one, we'll reevaluate for each hearing. So Pam Rooney, please state your name and where you live and then ask your question. Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Thanks for that three minutes. Um, you know, it's, it's really the only opportunity to weigh in on this kind of thing. I, I uh, appreciated the conversations um, comparing the mixed use buildings and the apartment buildings. On, uh, um, and I note that in other references to apartments, there was a statement that said, um, given the fact that these are completely uh, residential, uh, the, the effort of 
changing the zoning track from site plan review to special permit um, makes it slightly more difficult or a little bit longer journey to, um, to get an apartment approved. And I think the fact that we're trying to save for you know, this very special BG district is being saved for its commercial value, I think is very important. And it weighs in actually more uh, when we discuss the mixed use building so that having a greater percentage of commercial space is really the only differentiating factor between an apartment and a mixed use building in the BG. So we'll come back to the topic of of the split of um, percentage of commercial versus percentage of residential um, at another time. Um, Maureen answered the question of why there was no management plan, it's redundant. Um, I also noted that the design review standards would be applied, but it does not necessarily say that the design review board would review projects of this nature for an apartment. Um, and I, I'd like to have that clarified. And then finally, uh, it was interesting, I think Councillor Pam pointed out that um, the one case that a, a minimum landscape or open space is required happens to be in the BN. And you know, ironically, that's those are the parcels uh, of greatest size and greatest open space. Um, and so I just want to again clarify that in fact we are not requiring any um, set aside of open space or landscaped area in most of these districts. It is really just the BN where that applies. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, Maureen, can you answer her two questions on whether the DRB needs to review it and the requirement for set aside for open space in any of the other districts? Sure. Uh, so about the DRB uh, review uh, with the, the design review board. So uh, the districts that are uh, in the downtown, um, including the BL and the BG, um, uh, they would specifically uh, require a review of the de design review board. Um, and that goes for um, all exterior changes, regardless if it's an apartment, if it's a new sign, if there's a new restaurant coming in, they're putting in a sign, the DB, DRB needs to review it. If it's a new apartment, they would need to look at the exterior changes uh, if it is in those downtown districts. And then also if it's within, a, I think, 100 feet of the town, town common. And then in the other zoning districts, um, the, the planning board or the zoning board of appeals uh, do need to apply the design principles and standards, and they may, uh, may choose to um, seek the, um, the review and recommendations provided by um, the design review board. And then about open space, additional open space. Um, while I do, uh, I, I, um, I agree that the BN does have additional open space requirements um, up, I believe 40% um, is required, um, you know, Oh, let's oh, let's look together. Hold on a second. Um, and so the maximum lot area coverage you can see in um, in each of these zoning districts. This uh, so in the RBC, um, the maximum. This means the maximum amount of impervious surface. So that means buildings, walkways, sheds, anything that has an impervious surface they can have no more than 40%. So that means 60% would be pervious surface, which would be you know, landscaping and the like. Um, same is true with the RG. So 60% of it would be um, landscaping. Um, and then in the RV, RF, not the goal, sorry. Uh, and then in the BG, um, it, it, is, it is small. Um, you know, um, it's at 95%. Uh, of impervious, um, there is a footnote A, but um, it is small. And the reason why is, is because that's um, the downtown where we are, um, you know, where there is dense uh, development of commercial and residential uses. And so that's why you see that um, more tight, denser developments 
and then in the BL, um, so um, I'm also doing math there. So 15% would be uh, would be uh, op would be landscaping, and then um, in the BBC that would be 30% would have to be uh, landscaping, and then in the BN. Um, this is actually wrong. This should be 60. So it's actually 40%. So right. for any other use, it would be 40% would have to be 45% would be landscaping, but for apartments, um, they would have to have 40% of landscaping. Thank you, Maureen. We're going to move on to Hilda Greenbaum. Please state your name and where you live and then ask your question. Um, my name is Hilda Greenbaum at 298 Montague Road. I'm finding some inconsistencies here between this and other parts of the bylaw. And the first one that I would like to bring up is the RVC, and I'm not exactly sure which village centers are RVC and which are different B v village centers. But in particular, I'm really concerned about making it easier to put apartments, which is three or more units on a lot where people have rather rigorous standards that they have to go through if they want to have a non-owner occupied duplex on the same lot, then they have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals and have a long list of conditions put on it. And yet you allow three people by right. And, and to me, that's a problem. I really think that our, his, our um, village centers are historic resources, especially up here in North Amherst, though I don't remember exactly what the zone is along North Pleasant Street here, but it's a big incentive to tear down some of these wonderful 19th century houses to put in apartment buildings if you make it that easy for them. And I don't think, I think we really want to preserve our, our historic village center, which is a, is a national historic site up here. So I really, would like you to think a little bit more about, do you really want to make a three plus building by right, but if you're coming in with a non-owner occupied duplex as all those buildings, many of those buildings are now, um, they have much more rigorous standards. The other thing, next thing is, um, I think, but I'm not sure that I remember that the bylaw says when a building abuts the RG district, particularly our historic cemetery, that it's both the side and the rear yard are supposed to be 20 foot setback, not and or, but, but both the side and the rear yard. But that just may be a question of ambiguity of the language. And then um, I see all over this table, we have footnote A, and I have been trying for 40 years, I think, to get rid of footnote A because it's a huge loophole. And either we have a bylaw that everybody has to, to uh, you know, abide by, or we don't have a bylaw that everybody has to, abide. and I would really like to get rid of the footnote A because it's all over the maximum building coverage in RVC. BG, BVC, where you want to put apartments. So it really, you may say 40, you know, maximum building really coverage of the building for 25%, but it has an A there. So if the two family house next door is, is bigger, then you can make it bigger than the two family house next door and say it fits in. So I have a real question. Please get rid of the A. And, um, and the question being, can you make your, can you, <laughs> decide that maybe that's a good idea. That's my question. And again, aesthetics are very important. And I, I, I would really, oh, this has to do with the DRB, that it, it's my understanding when we passed the bylaw back in 1983, due to the Bank of America replacing some very nice a row of brick stores that, um, that the DRB applied to the whole downtown, whether you put it required or may or you or how shall may whatever that it applied to the whole downtown is what I thought. Whether you have it in the bylaw or not. Thank you. Um, Mary. Maureen, I mean. Oh, Maureen, did you have an answer to one of those oh, questions? Uh, oh, sh um, sure. I mean, so uh, Hilda, to get back to uh, your comment about. Um, the RVC um, um, 
and with our proposal of of changing the permit pass path to site plan review, um, you know, if if there were were to be a a building that is 50 years or older, it would have to go through the historical commission uh, for. Um, their review and approval of the demolition. So there is added um, safeguards uh, to historical homes uh, throughout Amherst. Um, and about their question or clarification uh, question about um, the twenty the the twenty foot setback uh, for rear and side yards uh, to um, parcels that are adjacent to a historic uh, a national historic property such as the West Cemetery or uh, to a, um, a residential district um, uh, in the BG specifically. Um, that is true. It is both for the side and for the rear. Um, so, and, and the, our uh, mock development shows that. And um, that, that's all. Thank you, Maureen. Mary Sayer, please state your name um, and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Mary Sayer, 159 Pine Street, District 1. Um, and I, I had some questions. Um, I think it was Dorothy asked the question, does this uh, raising the cap uh, or eliminating the cap just apply to B, G and B, what, I can't read the other one. Um, and I think your response was yes, in a way, because there isn't any other place that you could do apartments. But I think you would be raising the cap, I believe, on any apartment anywhere. Uh, so that's my first question. Um, another question is um, in um, North Amherst, I'm not sure how far the village center goes and how far the, um, the general area goes, but if there were three or four lots combined, um, it seems to me there would be, there could be space for an apartment or if further down, I don't know how far down it goes along Sunderland Road, but there are uh, businesses and things there that have lots that I assume would be bigger than um, most of the lots in North Amherst. And so I'm, I'm wondering if then the cap would be listed on combined lots. And the third thing was that if you don't believe any apartments can be built in this area, why would you change the um, the permitting process? Uh, it seems to me that if there's no reason to do it, if there isn't a thought that there could be apartments built. So those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Maureen, do you have any responses to those questions? Um, no, other than just repeating that uh, the BG and the BVC, because there is no requirement for lot area and additional lot area, um, that allows uh, it allows um, more opportunity for infill, and the other zoning districts um, do have those um, requirements, and so that's an added safeguard. And if if folks recall uh, the footnote M discussion, although this is twenty five hundred square feet for additional lot area uh, for apartments and townhouses, this actually turns into four thousand square feet. Um, so there are uh, safeguards um, in the zoning districts that are highlighted in blue. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Chris Brestrup, you have your hand up. Thank you. I wanted to answer um, a couple of Mary Sayre's questions with the fact that the reason that we um, think we should uh, lessen the permitting requirement in the RVC zoning district isn't so we can get large apartments there. It's so we can get small apartment buildings with, you know, three or five units without having to go through the special permit process. So we're not trying to promote units that were buildings that have over 24 units. We're trying to make it easier to build small apartments in the RVC. Um, now that's something that the planning board or the CRC may choose not to do. And um, if they were to choose to take that particular change out of this proposed amendment, that would be perfectly legitimate and within the scope of the amendment because you're lessening the change. So that's something that could be considered. We wanted to offer that as an idea 
and if the planning board and the CRC think that's not a good idea, they can make that recommendation. So that's thank, all. Thank you, Chris. Um, Elizabeth Veerling, please state your name and your address and then ask your question. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, this is Elizabeth Veerling at 36 Cottage Street. And I just had a question. I had a couple of questions and a comment. And that was with regard to your saying that this would not impact the BL. However, there's now a zoning overlay proposal out there. And so I was wondering what happens with the zoning overlay? Does that then allow these larger than 24 unit apartments once you put that overlay on there? So again, all of these changes are linked. So trying to understand the linkage between this proposed zoning overlay and this particular um, change in apartments. Um, my other comment was just, I wanted to reiterate what has been said here about the, the issue of turning the BG into all apartments with no retail, which would be a very sad outcome. Um, and then finally, I just wondered, again, I know all of these things are linked and you have to pay attention to all the zoning bylaws, but I just wondered if in this particular bylaw, there should be some statement that the apartments have to conform or the building has to conform to the parking zoning bylaw or the parking bylaw. Um, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Maureen, do you have any response? Uh, sure. Uh, great questions, Elizabeth. So the B the proposed BL overlay district, um, which is um, the parcels uh, west of Kendrick Place, so may, I'm guesstimating maybe nine or 10 parcels um, uh, from Coles Lane to um, up to McCullen Street. Um, and the depth of that overlay district where the building footprint would be located is, uh, would be uh, 100 feet back uh, with a fronted zone in the front and then the adjacent BL underlying district in the back. Um, but so to answer your question, um, with that proposal, we are proposing that the basic minimum lot area, additional lot area per family and the lot frontage would not be required for any development. So this, that the overlay district there would um, also uh, encourage more apartment buildings, but it would be in those uh, that specific confines of the overlay districts. Um, and, uh, and something t also to note that, you know, the town is in the process of hiring a design consultant uh, to look at our design standards. And, you know, part of, you know, if it is form-based codes, form-based codes also get into dimensional regulations, um, such as the, the very table that we're looking at. Uh, and so um, the BL overlay district, which gets into dimensional regulations, could be applied in other districts um, if that's something that the, the town is interested in. And then let's see here, what else? Um, parking, um, about parking requirements. Well, if you wait until 10, a, at 10 p.m., we are going to talk about our uh, parking proposal um, for apartments. Um, what else? Apartments, mixed use buildings, and uh, supplemental dwelling units um, that they would, an adequate amount of parking would need to provide it based on specific factors that are uh, reviewed and approved by uh, either special per permit grant authority. Thank you, Maureen. Um, Kathy Shane, please state your name, where you live, and ask your question. Hi, I'm Kathy Shane and I'm speaking as a resident. I live on 519 Montague Road in the far north of Amherst. Um, I, my questions are a little, in a way, repeat, but I want to phrase it in a, a slightly different way. If we think because of lot sizes that there's no impact in several of the districts, why lift the cap at all? Why not leave it at 24? And my question is, why not have a variable cap depending on the districts? I've looked at, in terms of where the apartments might go, and I've looked at a few cities and towns and they do that. Um, so it's, it's not one size foot all. So that's a question as well as a comment. Um, second would be, um, rather than going from 24 to no cap, um, 
in the places where it might make sense to increase is why not put a new cap on um, double 50? You know, why take the giant leap? A few other times people have talked about incremental change to see how it works. I think this is a place where caution might be um, worth it. Then I'm not sure why I understand why even in the current table, but we would continue, why exempt BG from the two feet um, per additional two feet on either side per floor. Um, Mandy pointed out that that's somewhat protective as the building gets higher, there's more open space. So why not apply that to BG, you know, make that an additional piece of this to protect that. Then the other thing that could be done in BG rather than hoping that the planning board or the zoning board might do something about open space, you could say, if you wanna build an apartment, um, the building coverage is no longer 70%, we're gonna reduce it to 60%. The lot coverage is no longer 95%, we're gonna re reduce it to 85%. Because we want apartment buildings to have some open space, some play areas, some benefits that people might wanna live long-term. So, and I've seen that in some New York areas where in the middle of commercial district, you get pretty attractive. They're not quite Gordon apartments, but they're cool. So that would be a way of, making it still to the advantage to do a mixed building, creating a disincentive to do apartment buildings. Then I don't understand why you're reducing um, going away from special permit for, from, for RVC, why not keep it? I think you have the same arguments um, for, you wanna be protective of those areas and mixed use has a special permit, so why not the same? And finally, it's a pure question because I don't understand it, not related to your proposed change, but we have one district, B-N, I think, with a floor area ratio of 0.3. And nobody, nobody, I can't find floor area ratios anywhere else. I don't know what the purpose of that is, why that's there, um, and does is that an additional protection? So that's a pure question. I understand what a floor area ratio is. What I don't understand is, how seldom it's used except for this one area. Those are my comments, questions. Thank you, Kathy. Um, let's, let's get an answer to the floor area ratio. I think the most of the rest of the questions were mainly for considerations during deliberations. Sure, okay, thank you. Um, so floor area ratio, it, it, is, an, um, it is a conventional zoning um, measure. Um, that is a, just a generic uh, uh, ratio, unlike a uh, smart codes and form-based codes, um, but th they do have merit and uh, they uh, dictate the bulk and mass of a building. And, uh, and, it, and by doing that, it dictates the gross floor area that would be allowed for, uh, the, for that building. Um, and so the size of each floor would uh, be dictated by that 0.3 or whatever the ratio is, but in that in the BN, there's a 0.3 uh, ratio. And so um, when you compare, I, I did a, a build, I did a, um, I did the math and looked at a, uh, a, a mock example of a, an apartment building um, in the BN. I just, just made up a generic one acre lot it was an apartment building versus any other use allowed in, in the BN. And it reduces the, the, the footprint of the building by 15%. Um, and so, the, the, and it reduces the height. So again, it, it, it dictates the, the, so, the bulk and the mass of the building. And, um, and so with that safeguard in the BN specifically geared towards apartments, um, that is, uh, deterring developers to, uh, I would, I would say that uh, developers probably would not pursue um, placing an apartment building in the BN because it, it reduces the footprint to such a measure. Thank you, Maureen. Um, we are going to move on to public speaking in favor of revision. We have Elizabeth. I do see your hand. Um, since you've already asked questions, I'll I'll take your hand again during the public speaking in favor or in opposition. Um, for anything, but we're going to move on to public speaking in favor. If you would like to speak in favor of these revisions, please raise your hand right now and we will, I will recognize you.
Seeing none, we're gonna to move to public speaking in opposition of revision. Please raise your hand if you would like to speak in opposition of these revisions. And at that time, I will recognize you as the hands get raised. Uh, Hilda Greenbaum, please um, unmute yourself and you have three minutes. I am absolutely opposed to making it easier to put apartments in neighborhoods, especially residential village centers, making it easier to put in larger apartment buildings than it is to put in a duplex. I think that all the reasons that we have made it difficult for owner-occupied duplex or put so many regulations on owner-occupied duplexes is because we know of the problems. And I'm looking at Meadow Street right now, which is a disgrace to drive down. And I'm not exactly sure what the zoning is on the north side of Meadow Street, but those houses are in such bad repair that I can see them being combined by site plan review, abutting APR land into apartment buildings. And there have been many arguments over the years against more density on the north side of that street. And I think you're opening the door there for some very terrible consequences in the long run of, of a street where there is now very little control over those single family houses by the owners. And I think allowing things by right there that are larger than a single unit is, is not the way to go. And then my other reason that I, I, I'm against this is you haven't gotten rid of footnote A and footnote A opens the door again to lots of things that we can't even contemplate. Unintended consequences that will come up once the problem arises and then you're stuck with it and you don't have a way to solve it. So. The, those are those are the two things that I'm against, and I, I I think we're going the wrong way by allowing apartments downtown because we want to increase the commercial base so that there'll be a reason for people to want to go downtown. If you have a downtown that's all apartments and all residential, what's the point of anybody wanting to go there? And what would attract tourists to this town? And what are they going to do here? Look at apartment buildings. So I think that's the wrong way to go. Thank you, Hilda. Mary Sayer. Unmute, thank you. Um, well, I just wanted to say that I'm, um, I'm against changing the um, permitting in the, the village centers. And I agree with um, the questions that Kathy raised and also that Hilda raised. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, at this point, we will be moving on to, oh, Pam Rooney, you got your hand up just in time. Thank you, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Um, Ms. Greenbaum stated most of my concerns um, more articulately than I can. I think um, having uh, the SPR and the SP reversed for BG and residential uh, village center don't seem to make much sense. And I, and I think given uh, Ms. Pollock's uh, analysis, it also doesn't really make much sense to tinker with the building of uh, the, the, the dwelling unit cap. I think the, the cap of 24 units is probably a result of wanting a sort of a comprehensible soci sociologically um, contented neighborhood where you kind of know up to the up to 24 people within your building and it becomes a comprehensible number to deal with um, it doesn't mean that you can't do multiple buildings they can't be done um, artistically and with architectural character and create some outdoor open space um, it just doesn't seem, it, you know, a lot of effort has gone into this, but it just doesn't seem to have moved the ball forward very much on apartments. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. At this time, does the planning staff have anything else they want to add before we move back to questions from the board and committee? Seeing 
Seeing not, we're going to go to questions from the board or committee. Um, I want to remind our boards that we have three more hearings to do tonight. I'm trying to move us along. It can be tough, but um, I want to think about whether we're ready to close a hearing after these questions or not, um, or whether the hearing will need to be continued. So any other questions from the board or committee members? Janet. Um, so I felt somewhat comforted by the assurances that these hearings can be continued and Lynn, um, town council chair Lynn Griesmer that we're not in a hurry and that we can go slowly. I have a lot more questions and I have to note that most of the questions people have asked haven't actually been answered. And so I wonder if it would be productive for me to ask more questions. And I don't know what other people, other questions people have, um, or should we just make a motion to continue and move on to the next? Because um, I'm sort of at a little bit of a loss, you know, in this process, like, the planning board saw this briefly on May, in May. We talked about it last week in the context of four zoning amendments. And um, I don't know how much time we spent on it, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes. And now we're in this hearing with, you know, 12 people. Um, so would, do you want me just to keep asking questions or I just want, I don't I want to. No, that, that, that's, that's a good, a good thinking, Janet. Let's, let's. Yeah. Let's hear a little bit from our committee members as to whether they're thinking about continuing the hearing or um, would like to close it so that Janet has some ideas to whether she should ask her questions or not. Um, Dorothy and then Andrew. Um, I would find it useful to once again hear why this and why now, because I'm not sure that it gets us something that we really want or need. Um, so the words density and units, okay, would, there would be more density, there would be more units, but would this be creating livable spaces for um, a variety of people? Um, the question of the, we know that there's a lot of discussion of what we can do about the downtown business section what is within our control, what is not within our control. Um, and I guess, I think somebody else said this, I'm thinking maybe it would really be better rather than trying to, to do the density by encouraging apartment buildings, which are really gonna be very big downtown to work on the mixed use and get that in better shape so that we would have a combination of, of uh, dwelling units, places that people could call home, combined with some kind of commercial or business or um, uh, social, artistic, some kind of interactive um, activities on the first floors that would make for a lively town. So that, that is a question and a comment. Why no. not just fix the, be, the, the mixed use and not try to deal with it by putting a lot of apartment buildings downtown? Thank you, Dorothy. I want to remind everyone we're talking about whether to continue or close this hearing at this point. Andrew. Uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be inclined to continue. I think um, both Dorothy and Janet made some points, which, which I agree with, which I think that if we had some more time to, um, to review the information may at least lead me to a different decision. Um, I, I would, I would be in favor of continuing. I think also it's just, there is a lot on the docket to go through and this is a complex one. And th th I, I do wanna add or just kind of pile on with, with what Dorothy said. I think that apartments isn't the issue right now. I think mixed use buildings is really more important. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks. Any other thoughts from committee members? I am not seeing any other hands. The only people that have spoke are in favor of continuing. If we continue, we need to pick a date certain. Um, and so the next dates that Chris Brestrup have given us are August 18th, September 1 and September 29. I'm going to assume the planning board members are available on the dates the planning board meets, which are those three dates. Um, so I would like to hear from my committee members, CRC members, whether I can get a quorum for a joint hearing on August 18th 
September 1 or September 29? Um, Dorothy. Uh, August 18th, yes. Um, September, did you say 29th? 29th and September 1st. Yeah. But September 1st, no. We will be away, you know, it's the um, Labor Day weekend and we will not be in town. Evan or Shalini, do you have, are you guys available on August 18th or September 29th? Shalini. Yes to August 18th and uh, September 29th and no to September 1st. We have a district meeting. Ah. Evan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, I was just pulling up my calendar. It looks like I'm available any of those dates. So at this time I will entertain a motion from a planning board member to continue the hearing to August 18th at 6.45, no, 6.35 PM. Is there a motion from a planning board member? Sorry, what, what, could people do the 15th of September? I, I kind of missed that. Is that also available to this that year? That's not a date I was told was a planning board hearing. Okay. But 29th of September. Oh, I'm sorry, I was looking, okay, 29th, okay. Is that, is a 29th available to the CRC? The 29th of, of September is, nearly is more than two months from now. Um, Jack, you're muted. I should know better, huh? Um, but uh, yeah, I would move that we uh, continue the hearing to August 18th. At 6.35 p.m. Yeah. Chris Brestrup, uh, can I get, a, is there a second from a planning board member, Doug? Uh, you can't get the second from me. Okay. Um, Andrew? I'll second. Okay. Chris Brestrup, you had your hand up, and then Doug? I, I wanted to comment on Janet's question about September 15th. Um, Yom Kippur begins at sundown on September 15th, so that wasn't one of the dates that was um, okay. considered to be available. So Doug. Yeah, I guess I, I, I was belated and didn't quite see how the conversation was gonna go, but um, I probably would be one vote to close the hearing and uh, thought I should say that before we got any farther. Nope. nope. Any other discussion from the planning board members on the motion to continue the hearing to August 18th? I just also want to say that I think I would fall into the camp with Doug to go ahead and close the hearing on this. Janet? So I'm trying to figure out how to get the questions that the public have asked. I have asked and I have more questions to ask to the planning department and the CRC and the planning board so we can kind of mull that before we meet again about it without, um, you know, maybe exposing those questions to the public so we don't um, violate open meeting law. Or I would just request that when we meet in um, August, just to take some more time than a half hour or 45 minutes. I just think this is very detailed and there's a lot to it we haven't covered. Chris? Um, if people wanted to send me and Maureen your questions, um, we can put them in a list. And I think Maureen and Pam and I, Pam Field Sadler, um, have all been taking notes on this. So we have, we know what questions people have asked. So we could come up with a list of questions for August 18th. And um, we can also publish them on the town, on the planning board website. Um, so oh, I don't great. think it's a question of uh, open meeting law. So that's one way of dealing with this. Thank you, that's great, thank you. Jack. You're muted, Jack. 
Yikes. I, I'm not used to this. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I just, I, I see, um, you know, a couple of members looking at uh, continuance and a couple that want to uh, close the hearing. And I, I, I guess I would like to hear from Tom Long uh, on this. Uh, I mean, I'm on the fence because I think we have a lot of items to go through. I think there are a lot of questions. Um, I would love to close the hearing today and, and um, you know, go through the agenda that we have. Um, but I, I don't feel like um, it's going to move fast enough. I think there's too many questions and I think it's just going to hold up the rest of the things that we need to get through um, um, today. So um, I'm, I'm on the fence and I'm sort of going to abstain from making a decision. On it. I think that's where I am as well. So, um, so it is the planning for the planning board to decide on this motion. Um, if this motion fails, another motion can be accepted at any time, um, as well as questions continuing to be asked until a motion that that is made passes. Andrew, can I call a question? We have the motions on the floor, right? The motion is on the floor. Um, move on. Formally calling on the question requires a two-thirds vote and is not dispute, is not debatable. So I'm going to go to an immediate vote on ending debate. Um, I'm just going to go down my list of members. It's not in any particular order. So pardon oh. me for not being in um, alphabetical order. Janet, uh, the calling of the question is not debatable. So, so I have a point of I have order. A I have a point of order. We never do, we, the planning board doesn't call the question. Usually we just vote on the motion. So that's not our usual, I, so I'm not quite sure what's happening. So Robert's rules allows for calling the question because someone is intending to end debate and go immediately to a vote. And so we will follow Robert's rules and vote on the motion to call the previous question. Okay. A vote of yes ends debate. A vote of no allows continuing discussion on the motion to continue the hearing. Jack. Uh, yes. Doug. I'm sorry, would you say that? A yes and a no again? A yes ends debate, a no continues debate on the motion to continue the hearing. Thank you. Uh, yes. Janet. Yes. Johanna. Yes. Andrew. Yes. Tom. Yes. That is unanimous. We will now go to an immediate vote on the motion to continue the hearing to August 18th at 6.35 p.m. Uh, Jack. Uh, that's a yes. Doug. No. Janet. Yes. Johanna. No. Andrew. Yes. Tom. No. That was three yeses, three noes. As a tie vote, the motion to continue the hearing fails. We are now continuing the hearing and can continue with questions or another motion at any time. Wow, okay. Doug? Well, I guess then I should uh, move to, to close the hearing. Is there a second? Second. Um, was that Andrew or was that Tom? Tom. Tom, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> um, is there debate on the motion to close the hearing? And Dorothy, we'll, we'll hear you later. This is a planning board motion. Um, so, Johanna. Sorry, my hand was a residual hand raised. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, Janet. So I'm a little stunned that we would close a hearing debating um, changes to the apartment's definition that we haven't, even, we haven't had much information on some of the information that was provided in terms of impacts on one or two lots, you know, there were some adjustments that we made, we haven't seen anything, you know, for different areas. There's still more questions. Um, there's been no impacts analysis or discussion. There's no history of why the 24 limit cap is, 
there's many alternatives that have been suggested actually by the planning board previously, planning department. And so I, 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 I'm astonished that anyone would look at this, you know, I don't know if we spent more than an hour and 15 minutes on this and just, just to reel back in time, almost a year ago, it, at the end of a very long meeting, there was a move to close the, to, to abolish or shut down the zoning subcommittee. And what you're seeing here is the loss of very thorough, very deep look at zoning changes that are discussed with the public, with the planning department and the planning board, you know, going through the ideas, you know, looking at alternatives, gathering information. And, you know, I was objecting that the planning board didn't even know that this was going to come to the town council for referral. And I was, you know, Lynn Greismer said, don't, you know, no, you know, take as much time as you can. Um, planning director Krestrup said we can continue the hearings and, you know, go through it as we want to. And here we are really at what I thought is kind of my nightmare, which is just a very cursory look at a very profound change without a lot of information. And I know my questions are tiring. Um, and that's why I am the vice chair of the, the now on hiatus zoning temp committee, because it's, this is the kind of detailed work that needs to be done. And so I don't know how people are going to vote on this if they, I would vote not to recommend because there's been very little analysis. There are no strict design controls. There's no impact statement. We don't know how it's going to affect historic buildings. We don't know how it's going to affect neighborhoods, all these things that are in the master plan. And so I just would ask my fellow members to just continue it. And let's, I'll send my questions, my nitty gritty questions and ideas to the planning department and we'll just take another go at it next month. So that's my request to my fellow members. Thank you, Janet. Doug, your hand is still up. Did you wanna say something? Oh, you just lowered your hand. I, oh. I, I lowered it because uh, I thought you called on me. Yep, okay, your turn. Okay, um, so, uh, you know, at the last meeting that the planning board discussed this last week, uh, we were invited to submit questions to Chris Brestrup that she could answer for this meeting tonight. And it appears that that didn't happen. Um, I uh, do not view this as a drastic change to the bylaw. And I think that uh, as Maureen ha has shown, the predominant impact of this will be in very limited geographic area in the BG and the BVC. Um, and the, the BVC has substantial uh, requirements for open space and uh, you know, maximum lot coverage that's well below that, uh, you know, the whole parcel. So I, I don't think that this is a con should be a particularly controversial change. Um, the table three limits the size of buildings in you know, all of the districts with the exception of, of BG, really. And, and in fact, we are making it more difficult to build an apartment building in the BG if this passes. So the fear that people have that uh, the BG is going to be overrun with apartments if we pass this you know, makes me wonder how everybody's been sleeping at night because it's already easier to do an apartment in BG than we would make it if we passed this tonight. So um, I feel like we've had adequate conversation. Um, you know, if, uh, you know, if we can get them, I mean, I'm, I, if we wanna really delay this, that's fine, but I don't know what else what kind of analysis the planning department could do to satisfy the infinite number of options that you know could happen on all the parcels that are affected and all the different ways a design might happen. So I think the request for additional analysis is, is sort of futile. Um, so I'm ready to vote on it. Thank you, Doug. Jack, and then Tom. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I agree with Doug. I'm, I voted um, for the continuance more just trying to get a straw poll uh, from things. So if we're split, 
you know, given Doug's argument, I'm, I'm certainly willing to close the hearing. We'll deliberate further. Uh, we're not going to, uh, but we can certainly close the hearing. I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't feel like um, the, uh, the article, it's, it's, you know, basically cleaning things up, uh, but I don't think it's uh, going to lead to significant changes, but it, it, I like the improvement that it potentially could provide to the bylaws, but um, so I will vote for, um, you know, any of the hearing and, and then deliberating further, you know, after, the, after this session. Thank you, Jack. We're gonna try and keep comments to um, the motion on the floor, which is to close the hearing, Tom and then Andrew. I just wanted to concur with um, what Doug said and, and agree that um, moving forward, it seems like the, um, the correct thing to do given the, the time um, and the um, response that um, the planning board has given us in terms of the questions we, we would have had. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks. Yeah, I think the, the piece of information that I was looking for, I know Janet requested last week and I agreed was was like a broader massing study. So we've got a couple uh, example of a couple of parcels, but I would love to sort of see more like more what a build out would look like. I think maybe more importantly is um, because there are some additional questions. We've got public comment. We've not in, you know accounted for any of that. Um, if there isn't really a sense of urgency, I don't feel strongly compelled to push it through. If there's opportunity to digest and process feedback that we've received. And I, I agree, Doug, like I think there are a gazillion ways we could look at this, but but we've looked at you know two examples. Uh, I think that we could do a little bit more. I, I don't want to drag this on forever, but it also feels like we're rushing. Thanks. Janet, Janet then Johanna. I have a question. So if we close this public hearing, what's the consequence of that? Um, do we have 14 days to give a recommendation and a report to town council? Um, I, I thought we had to keep the public hearing open so we can keep our deliberation and discussion. Can we close the public hearing and continue to meet and discuss this in an, in an, as a planning board without a joint hearing and then you know eventually come to a recommendation and then do it? Or do we have an infinite amount of time? I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to spend enough time. So I thought if we close the public hearing, we're on a 14 day track to issue our report. Uh, not, not quite. Um, so closing the public hearing triggers a 90 day time start for the council to get to a vote without having to hold another public hearing. So it would trigger, it would start a three month clock. Um, the council cannot vote until 21 days after the planning board has closed its hearing or the planning board has submitted its report and recommendation to the council, whichever is earlier. So you have a minimum of 21 days to submit the report. It can take longer, um, but the council cannot vote until after 21 days has passed if you do not submit a report. So it's yeah. not a 14 day timeline, it's a minimum of 21 days. Um, and given the council and how it gets to stuff, you'd probably have more than 21 days because CRC has to do its thing and then GOL has to do its. And then it's two readings at the council before a vote can even happen. No, I understand that. I'm just wondering what the requirements of the state law are. State law is the council cannot vote for 21 days after the hearing is closed at the planning board. And so it's it's considered a 21 day deadline to submit a report because if you don't, if the planning board doesn't submit one within 21 days, the council can go ahead and vote without that report and recommendation. Um, I don't know of any 14 day deadline, but Chris Brestrup, do you have any other? No, I was gonna say exactly what you were going to say. And okay. I was gonna suggest that the planning board um, schedule it's um, time for discussion about this and it's time for a vote and that they not try to do it tonight because you have three more hearings to get through. And Johanna just unraised her hand. Johanna, do you have anything to say? In the spirit of moving on to other things, I don't. Okay. Um, seeing no other hands at this time for the planning board motion to close the hearing, we're going to move to a vote. Jack. Yes. Doug. Yes. Janet. No. 
Johanna. Yes. Andrew. No. Tom. Yes. The motion is four to four in favor, two against. So the motion passes. The hearing is closed on the planning board side. I'm going to move to CRC. Is there a motion that a member of CRC would like to make? Dorothy? I move that we continue the hearing. Is there a second? But Dorothy, your motion has to include a date and time. To the September um, 29th date. I move that we continue it to the September 29th. There were so many questions here and that needed to be answered that we needed time. So that date is a planning board scheduled hearing, not a scheduled meeting, not a CRC scheduled uh, meeting. So Mandy, I don't know what, kind, what date I should put down, right? So this is to continue the hearing, right? And the continuing the hearing has to be a planning board date. Did it, it, or is no, it- No, the planning board just closed their hearing. I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. So I'm just gonna object, how's that? I'm just gonna say, and I have a lot to say, all right? Um, so it's, it's not in the form of a motion. I mean, what is the point of a public hearing? Is it just, oh, we have to do it, we're required to do it. Oh, we did it, great, done. Now we, now we can go on and do something else and mess up something else. Um, as a CRC member, I don't know the impacts of these changes. Uh, the drawing that was given to us tonight raised more doubts than it answered anything. Um, so I have profound fears. I mean, that drawing looked like an old style tenement building. Um, so what, what, is, what are we trying to do? Uh, people have mentioned there are many small parcels that can be combining of parcels, but there's a, there's a possibility of mega apartment buildings downtown, um, whether people would want to do it or not want to do it, I don't know. But why should we pave the path, lay out the red carpet and say, come on in and do it if we haven't even gone through it and clarified the points. I mean, we ask the public to come to these hearings. They come, they try, they speak, they try to keep up with the, 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 the information. And then it's like, okay, done. And we have so many questions that weren't answered. So, you know, if we're doing this for real, then let's do it for real. If it's just pro, pro forma, then let me know and I won't get so excited. Evan. So, I personally have the information that I need. I think Doug, um, when he was speaking in favor of his motion on the planning board, summed up my thoughts quite a bit. I, I don't think that this is a terribly complicated proposal. It is essentially making it more difficult to build apartments in the downtown business district, easier to build apartments in one of the more high density residential districts and removing an arbitrary cap on the number of apartments per building and letting the dimensional regulations that currently exist determine the size and scale of the building. So that's really doing those three things. And I think that there will always be more questions. Uh, the public committee members will always have more questions. We will always want more detail. But at this point, I personally have enough information to move forward into deliberation. Um, I think a lot of the public questions were questions that were more comments. It's, have you considered this? And I think that that's appropriate for our deliberation, but does not necessitate, necessitate us keeping open the public hearing. So that said, I will move to close the public hearing. Is there a second to that motion? Shalini? I second that. Is there any further discussion on the CRC motion to close the public hearing? Um, yeah, I, what I'm hearing is um, a lot of concern because it sounds like there's change and change is always scary. But what I heard in um, Maureen's responses and Chris's responses was that they are making it harder to build apartments in BG what I heard is we want to make it easier to build apartments in, and smaller developments actually and open that up for more housing. We all know we have a problem with, you know, with housing in general and affordable housing. So 
there are there were concerns raised about historic districts and that was answered also that we have a committee that looks into those impacts so many of the impacts that are being asked for they are already either in design guidelines or they're there in the other committees that are looking for so the very small change that we're looking at right now i don't want to say it's small it is big but the impact of that seems to be in alignment with what we want as what we've set up as our goals and and i think it's a good it's very important and that's already been acknowledged by chris that creating an faqs page because it feels like the questions are very similar and they are okay last thing yeah just the last thing is that just to create the faqs page basically because and put put that up there. We're we're discussing whether to close the hearing, not deliberating on whether we support. Oh, yeah. So basically, that would, those were the reasons for closing, and uh, and if you can put up the FAQs page, then we can, you know, direct people to to that. So yeah, I'm in favor of closing. Dorothy. Well, I'm in favor of continuing, and perhaps to September 28th when there is a CRC meeting. Um, Evan, and I really do applaud your calm tone, uh, which was trying to make me feel less concerned. But when you said it was to make it easier to build apartments in high density residential areas, okay, is that the purpose? I, it's not clear what the purpose of these changes are. These motions have changed so many times and that each time we look at them, we're not sure what's happening. Um, I think it is not clear to me what is the purpose of these changes. I don't think it has really been carried out far enough. So I would like to continue the hearing to September 28th. Thank you, Dorothy, for your comments. Evan? All I'll say is I can answer that question for you, Dorothy, from my perspective, right? And I think we all have our reasons, but we can't deliberate at this stage. And it sounds to me like a lot of the questions that you're you're asking, why are we doing this? What are the perspectives? I'm like on the edge of my seat wanting to respond to you, but I can't because that's deliberation. And so to me, it makes sense to close the hearing. So as body, we can move on to the deliberation and have those conversations um, at that point. Thank you, Evan. Seeing no other hands, we're gonna move to a vote. Um, we're gonna start with Shalini. And this is to close the hearing. Close yes, the hearing. yes, yes. Um, Mandy is a yes. Dorothy? Sorry, no. And Evan? Yes. A motion to close the hearing passes three to one. Um, with that, I was going to move on to the second one, second hearing on this plan before we took a break, but this one went a little bit longer. And so I think the committees would probably like a five minute break right now before we move on to the rest of our meeting. So we will re- Re, we will recess until 8.30, um, and at 8.30 we are back. Turn your videos on when you come back. I intend to start at 8.30.
If you've returned, please un uh, please start your video so that I know everyone is here. Um, I would like to begin the meeting soon so that we've got a lot more to continue on to. Mandy. Yes, is that Doug? Uh, yeah, that's Doug. I'm going to be probably uh, turning off my video for most of the rest of this meeting. That's fine. Thank you for letting me know. It looks like we have everyone but Shalini back. So we're going to start taking the roll call. Um, Chris, you have your hand up. I just wanted to say that it would be up to each separate group to, uh, in other words, the planning board or the CRC to determine when they would have their deliberations. Is that correct? And that, that is correct. you're intending to go on to the next public hearing right now, right? Correct. Thank you. So um, say you're present if you're here, I'm gonna go through the planning board members and then the CRC members, and then we're gonna move right on. Jack. Here. Doug. Present. Janet. Here. Johanna. Here. Andrew. Present. Tom. Here. Dorothy. Here. Melanie. Here. And Evan. Present. Okay, with that at 8.32 p.m. In accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing of the Amherst Planning Board and the Community Resources Committee of the Amherst Town Council has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw, zoning bylaw Article 3, Use Regulations, Section 3.325, Mixed Use Buildings, and Article 12 Definitions. To see if the town will vote to amend Article 12 Definitions and to add a definition of mixed use buildings, to amend Article 3, Section 3.325, Mixed Use Buildings, to remove the definition of mixed use buildings from Section 3.325, to amend the criteria and standards required for mixed use buildings, to set criteria to limit the amount of residential use and, incur in, and enclosed parking, that would be allowed on the first or ground floor, to set a minimum for the amount of non-residential use other than enclosed parking that would be allowed on the first or ground floor, to require any dwelling units or enclosed parking on the first or ground floor to be located towards the rear of the building and designed to reduce visibility from the public right of way, to add a requirement regarding the size bedroom count of units and to authorize the permit granting authority to determine which floor is to be considered the first or ground floor for sloping lots and lots with multiple frontages. The public hearing plan will be the same as it was last time. Are there any board or member committee member disclosures? Seeing none, um, the planning department will make its presentation. I believe this is Maureen again. Uh, no, sorry, uh, it's Nate. I'll it's be Nate. making the presentation. We're giving sorry, Maureen a, you know, a little time <laughs> off so she can have dinner. The, Go ahead. Um, so this is the, the mixed use uh, building standards. And I, I'm assuming the mixed use uh, is up there. Yes, it is. Great, thanks. So there, you know, currently, as, um, as mentioned before, there's a section just in the use chart uh, for mixed use buildings. Um, it provides minimal standards um, and no definition. Um, and so uh, we've gone over this. Um, there, the proposal strategy, uh, you know, provides a definition in Article 12, so it's, you know, it actually have a, a separate definition, uh, provides a few standards for uses, um, you know, specifically the first floor use and orientation and the diversity of bedroom counts, uh, similar to what was proposed in the apartment building. And so, you know, uh, you know this strategy has been refined before it had included, you know, design standards and others, uh, other things. It's really been refined to address the definition in first floor use, uh, the proportion of uses. And so it's really been refined to, um, to you know, address what has been seen as an issue with mixed use buildings. Uh, the new definition is one or more building containing, a building containing one or more dwelling units. So um, you know, it's one or more in combination with permitted non-residential uses. And the key here is non-residential uses. We're not specifying um, you know, specifically retail or a specific use. It's any non-residential use permitted in uh, the zoning bylaw. 
and that allows flexibility for occupying that space. Uh, there's standards and conditions. So on the first or ground floor, a maximum of 60% uh, shall be used for residential use or enclosed parking. Um, a minimum of 40% of the first floor. So this is a minimum shall be for non-residential use, you know, and incidental spaces. Um, parking is excluded from this ratio. So in a mixed use building, we're proposing three categories of uses for just the mixed use building, uh, parking, residential and non-residential. And so what we're saying here is 40% of the ground or first floor has to be non-residential use, commercial use, retail, um, you know, office use, anything that's non-residential. Um, a maximum of 60% is for the residential use or enclosed parking. So it could be residential parking, um, you know, would have to be, you know, it's limited to 60%. And these ratios have been, you know, tailored to what we think works in Amherst. There was a chart that was emailed out to the planning board and it showed a number of communities across the state and in a few other states. And really there's no one formula to address, you know, what, right what are the right proportions for a mixed use building on the first floor or upper floors and so it's really about how each community can envision what it what it needs and what the demands are in that community and so incidental space is important it's storage it's entryways i just moving down on the slide elevators and so um you know there is a fair amount of incidental space related to each use and so that could be anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of a use could be incidental space and that's factored into these maximums Examples of non-residential uses include retail, businesses, institutional uses, uh, public service, consumer services, office, um, office space, or similar principal uses or accessory uses. And you know, we think this offers flexibility. So, you know, narrowly defining it to if it was only a retail use, that could actually, you know, be a way to prohibit or preclude mixed-use buildings from being developed because of the difficulty of renting those spaces, but by having non-residential use as a category, it provides more opportunity for what, what could actually occupy that 40, that minimum 40%. Um, as part of the standards and conditions in the use chart, so right now we'd be eliminating the standards and conditions in the use chart and we'd be proposing new standards. Um, you know, that enclosed parking on the ground floor is located at the rear of the building and designed to reduce visibility from the public way or walkways. Um, that there's, you know, um, a sloping lot that the permit granting authority could decide what is the ground or first floor on a sloping lot or a lot with multiple frontage, so something that's on a corner lot. And, you know, we're having the same language that was proposed in apartments that for a, a building with 10 or more units that there's some diversity of bedroom size. And here's an example. Um, building C is really where the um, Bertucci's building is located. And this example is showing, you know, if there is a, a development along East Pleasant Street, uh, East Pleasant Street is shown here, what does 40% look like? And, you know, this is just a concept. So there could be, you know, you could say that spaces could be manipulated a little differently, but this is to show A is the retail space, you know, or non-residential space at 41%. B is uh, in the red is residential. Uh, C is parking and D is the incidental space. And so, you know, in this example is showing that 40% along the streetscape in this type of building is possible. Um, you know, with a lot that has narrow frontage and a deeper length, it could be, you know, 40% may be more challenging. It may be uh, require different site planning to get access to certain businesses or non-residential uses, but, um, you know, the 40% is really meant as a way to create, um, you know, an active streetscape. So it's required that, you know, the non-residential be along the street and the residential and the parking be um, located off of the street. And just for reference, you know, um, a few years ago, there was an economic development report uh, by Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, um, trying to look at what, you know, what are the market indicators in Amherst and, um, it wasn't just the town center, but it was the town in general. And it did say that, you know, that there is demand for certain uses in town. So whether it's um, smaller boutique stores, uh, some general merchandise stores, um, you know, it, it, what it indicated was that there is some um, market demand for, for non-residential uses. And, uh, you know, what, what we wanna hope with this mixed use building standard is to provide a definition that isn't there. And so, 
you know, whether or not there is availability now, it's really about if there is more density downtown um, and we don't provide space, it could be really difficult to retrofit a building to have the space that someone would want. Uh, so the 40% really is a minimum and it's meant to encourage non-residential uses. Uh, I'll just do a new share quickly, just to show the language. I'm gonna work from the memo that was presented a, a few weeks ago. And the definition here is in bold italics. It's what was on the slide, you know, building containing one or more dwelling units in combination with permitted non-residential uses. And so, um, you know, that would be an article 12 definition as I scroll up here, um, it shows the, the current uh, standards and conditions in Article 3 that would be removed in its entirety and replaced with these new uh, standards and conditions. You know, the 60% of the first or ground floor should be a combination of residential use or parking, the 40% minimum for non residential uses, um, the orientation that the dwelling units in close parking be located at the rear of the building or designed to reduce visibility from public ways, uh, the sloping lot. Uh, provision and then the bedroom count that no more than 50% of a dwelling of dwelling units shall have the same bedroom count of uh, the building with 10 or more units. And so that, you know, is to encourage some diversity of bedroom size. And those would be the new standards and conditions. Um, and so that's, that's the uh, kind of the amendment in its entirety. Thank you, Nate. Um, we're going to move on to questions from the board or committee. And let me know if you want me to stop sharing my screen or what you'd like to have. Let's, let's leave those up for now, um, just so the public can can really see them. Mm -hmm. uh, questions from the border committee, Evan. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm looking at that forty percent number, which you know this isn't the first time that I've seen this, um, but as I've thought more carefully about it, I've I've grown more concerned about it, um, especially looking at sort of the the list of um, uh, rough calculations of percentages that was provided in the memo showing that, you know, one East Pleasant would have missed it by 5%, U Drive South would have missed it by 1%. Um, and I think, you know, Nate said in his uh, introduction there that the goal of that 40%, I think was quote, to, to make sure you have an active streetscape but then also acknowledge that you could have sort of a lot that has a very small frontage and, and is very skinny. Uh, actually thinking about the building that Maureen showed us an example of, uh, you took the Ren's lot and the lot behind it, you'd have very little frontage. So you could have a building there that would be where the streetscape could be very active where you have commercial on the streetscape, but residential in the back and it'd be very hard to get that 40% without significant modification. Um, we've also heard talk about, well, what if, what if you wanted like a rooftop bar, right? And so what if that building had a rooftop bar that wouldn't count? And so this is leading to a question, which is, is there any flexibility in that 40% number if they were at 37% or they were at 30%, but there was a rooftop bar. So there was commercial on the rooftop. Is there any flexibility built into this for the permit granting authority? And if not, is that something that was discussed by the planning department um, to, uh, to allow flexibility? Or is that 40% num 40 number a hard? If you're 39%, sorry, you got to change your design. Nate. Yeah, I think that um, I could have, um, yes, I, I, you know, I think there is not much flexibility. You know, we have discussed it in terms of saying, you know, could this be a waiver request or what is the ability to, you know, to waive the 40% um, or have different parameters you know, having a minimum um, non-residential size uh, if a lot has a certain proportionality from frontage to depth or something. But I think, you know, we found that, uh, you know, trying to come up with language to capture every scenario uh, became more difficult to then um, understand what, what could happen there in terms of, you know, someone maybe splitting a lot or something or, you know, um, but the way this stands now, you know, there, the, there is no waiver provision um, if there is a project that really can't meet the 40%, there's always a variance request through the Zoning Board of Appeals, which is supposed to be a pretty high bar, you know, given uh, hardships that can't be, you know, that make this impossible to meet, right? So it could be that, um, right, there could be a lot that has such limited frontage and is such an odd shape that maybe has very, you know, 
it has uh, the minimum frontage necessary for a lot that it makes no sense to have 40% because most of the building uh, buildable area is so far back from a street. And so, you know, staff has discussed, you know, how to address that and is a variance request the right way, given that there may only be a few lots that actually would have trouble meeting the 40%. Um, and, and so, um, you know, in some communities, for instance, they might have, uh, you know, 85% of the frontage needs to be developed at a certain depth to meet the, to make it, you know, a retail space or a non-residential space. And, you know, the difficulty there is some might use 25 feet depth, some might say a 50 foot depth, but then all of a sudden you're still creating a percentage because you're saying if 100, 85% of your frontage at 50 feet deep, that is always a proportionality to the building. And so, you know, we were thinking 40% is the gross area of a building. So someone could manipulate their building you know, even if it's a hundred foot frontage and they have side setbacks and their building is smaller, the 40% is really of their building, not of the lot. So it, you know, it can, it can be manipulated and shaped to match the building design. Um, but given it now, it's a difficult waiver because it is the definition of mixed, of a mixed use building. You know, it's that, this is kind of the crux of the, of the whole piece. Thank you, Nate. Jack. Yeah, I, I, um, you know, with, with uh, Nate's response um, to Evan's uh, inquiry, I mean, I, I've, always, I've always thought like the 40% is, seems on the high side. And then, yeah, if you don't have um, uh, kind of a uh, equidimensional sort of lot, then it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense sometimes. Uh, uh, you know, we have a, a recent project in front of us that has a very narrow, frontage compared to the rear of the property that is, is more wide. And so that 40%, yeah, it, it, I've struggled with it, but um, I, I'm encouraged that again, we can try this and then um, if it doesn't, you know, if it's, you know, it may not be perfect, but we can always change it in the future. Uh, but again, if a waiver is sought, it goes to ZBA, we have a very good ZBA they have a great, you know, track record for turning out, you know, approvals of, of projects. So that there's some comfort in that as well. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Jack. Andrew. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I agree that uh, I think 40% is a good starting point. I think it could present challenges, but um, I think it moves us in the right direction. And then I don't know, um, Nate, whether you all have done this, but, you know, it might be interesting just to use the existing building footprints and do a, a quick slice of what the 40% would look like. Because I'm just scanning and I see some like bowling alley lots and some lots that are actually pretty broad and it could have very di different impacts uh, as we've all stated. So that might be a useful visual for us to put together is to get a sense of what that would look like and is it really workable? So I, I, I'd ask that we, we take a look at that. But I do feel like 40% is a good starting point. And also, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add to that that Maureen's example of the Bertucci's lot was very useful for me to see last week. So, so thanks for sharing that. And then the other thing I was going to say that came up in the conversation last week that Maureen had raised is, is the importance of having, um, making sure that we've got residential opportunities on the ground floor, um, especially for, for folks who have, um, who are, are not able-bodied or, or, or need access through a wheelchair. So thanks. Thank you, Janet. So I'm kind of wondering how we got down to 40%. So, you know, in 2016, um, the planning department, the planning board um, recommended to town meeting that we would have 60% non-residential on the first floor. And I think we're just to remind people, we're not just talking about like storefronts, but we're talking about different business uses and institutional uses. And so um, people can walk into a building and down the hall and go to the back of the building and go to professional offices or, you know, it could be a, it could be a state office or, you know, thing. So the purpose of the mixed use buildings was to help encourage residential downtown, which is, you know, or in business districts, which are primarily business. And so how did we go from 60% to 40%? Like, what was the thinking that led to that? Um, and I'm not sure if the CRC has seen this chart that was sent out, um, I think it was yesterday, about different cities and their mixed use requirements. And so 40% is at the bottom. It's not, you know, so 
Greenfield has 100% businesses on the first floor. Um, Northampton has 100%. Um, Brookline has 60% businesses on the first floor. And, you know, again, not just, you know, retail. I couldn't understand Cambridge, but they have a whole thing about depth and, you know, glazing and, you know, like whatever. Um, South Hadley has 100% first floor with some small exception for residential. Um, Watertown is, you know, the residential is primarily on the above floors, not more than 50% on the first floor. We were told um, by the planner there that it's actually, that it kind of works out to 85%. Um, and then the very interestingly named Umanqua, Washington State, doesn't allow ground floor residential. It's 100% business. So, um, you know, we, how did we get to 40% and, and why would it be difficult to have offices on a first floor in the, the side or behind the building? So I just don't understand how we got to such a small amount. And I, I just, I, you know, what has changed, um, you know, because I, I can't tell you, you know, there's 37 businesses in East Amherst that don't have any residential. They're small businesses. They're all thriving. They have come through, I hope, through the pandemic, the most difficult time. And there's just a lot of demand. We have more residents. Um, so I, I just don't understand how we got down to 40%. We're thinking that, you know, that's going to be hard to meet. It's, we need to make the space for businesses. We have to, you know, the less business space we have, the higher the rents are for those businesses, the harder it is for them to function. So I just can the can Nate can you tell us why did, why has what's happening with the disappearing business on the first floor in business districts? Thank you, Janet. Um, before Nate answers, the CRC has received that same document that you referenced, Janet, that the oh, planner good. got yesterday. Nate, I think, yeah, I think you know the forty percent is a minimum. You know anyone can still propose you know a four story office building downtown. It's not you know this is just in a mixed use uh, building, and so you know, there still can be a building that isn't a mixed use building that has multiple floors of non-residential use. Similarly, in a mixed use building, you still can have uh, upper floors be non-residential. The 40% is really just uh, on the first or ground floor. So, you know, if someone's still proposing a multi-story building, you know, the first two floors could be all non-residential. But what- really just you, having what, this, you know, this- what, what oh, yes, I'm, I'm getting there. So the 40% oh. I think is what, uh, you know, what will work for Amherst. And so some of these other communities, you know, if you, if, you know, if they think that they, you know, it's also in context of what other uses they permit uh, in their business districts or their downtown. So, you know, I know that the chart is helpful. It's also, you know, in these other, other communities, they may also allow, um, um, you know, apartments differently, they permit them differently. And so in Amherst, or they may have other office parks or other places where businesses can be located. So, I think if we had more than 40%, it would actually be a difficult to achieve in a mixed use building. It would actually probably have the effect of deterring mixed use buildings um, on, the, on the first floor. E even though we have a non-residential use category, it's not just retail. I think uh, you know, there's, there's difficulty in renting space downtown now. And I think you know, requiring that there's more space be allocated in the building without actually knowing what could be there would actually make it less likely to have development happen. Um, again, 40% is a minimum. So if a developer is, you know, proposing a building, they can figure out what they need to, you know, have to fit the space. So, you know, University Drive um, South has about 40%, right? So the, the new mixed use building that was permitted on the corner of um, Route 9 and University Drive. So they, you know, that developer went in knowing what the uses were and they, they would meet this 40% about. So I think it, you know, the 40% in my mind is actually going to change uh, kind of the how someone would, would go about a, developing a mixed use building. They'd have to have a little bit more forethought in terms of how they can actually occupy 40%. Um, so I think that's actually, it's still a, a, pretty, um, a pretty big amount of floor space that, that has to be dedicated to a non-residential use. Thank you. Shalini. Yeah, I, um, I think following up on Evan's question, I would like to, I wonder if you all, if the planning department has received feedback from developers, builders downtown and other places about the flexibility they would need to, I think I absolutely agree that this should be a minimum of 40%, but you know, just allowing for more creative solutions and what would work and have you all heard from builders what flexibility they might require to get more creative with 
how to create engaging retail community spaces in the mixed use buildings. And secondly, I was wondering, you know, it is expensive. Um, retail spaces are expensive in Amherst. So what would make it easier? Has there been any discussion with builders to create public market like spaces like Thorns Market and stuff instead of having like one big retail space. Has there been any discussion with developers how we could encourage more smaller retail spaces? And the third thing is, uh, what can we do to encourage more outdoor dining spaces? Nate? Sure, I'm sorry, just writing uh, the questions down. Mm -hmm. So I think the, um, so the first one, the, the, the creative solution, it's interesting. You know, we've had some discussions with developers. I've spoken with the bid and, you know, I'm not sure there's a, you know, you know, one answer won't, you know, one solution won't kind of answer everything, right? All the scenarios. I think, you know, some like the Center for New Urbanism, uh, someone emailed, um, developer emailed, and there's other articles that say, well, if, you know, a market is, is strong enough that you don't have to have any of these mixed use building standards, the developers will come in and be creative. I think the difficulty in Amherst is that the housing demand is so strong and the prices uh, you know, for rent are so high that it subsidizes a non-residential space. And so if we didn't have any, what we're seeing now, we have no definition of allocation of space and we're getting mixed use buildings with very small non-residential spaces because the housing market is so much stronger than the non-residential market. And so, sure, if both were equally strong, maybe we wouldn't need these standards, but that's not the case right now. So I think, you know, there's always um, opportunity for a developer to have a creative solution to, to, into, to spaces. And, you know, we're not, you know, we would encourage that and welcome that, you know, um, could we be more engaging in that possibly, but we're not, we're not prohibiting it now. We're, it's just not, you know, what's being presented to us is what's being presented to us. Um, you know, I think the public market is interesting. I think, um, you know, I'd have to talk to, you know, my colleagues and see, okay, how, you know, what, what does that look like, right? Again, is it, is it something that it's difficult to develop? So that's why someone isn't doing it. Um, is it expensive? What, what is the drawbacks there? Um, and outdoor dining, I think, you know, through the pandemic, we've seen the success of outdoor spaces. So, uh, you know, some of the other zoning amendments that are being looked at now um, would allow for that. And even, you know, the temporary zoning measures do too. And so maybe that's something that would become another, a future, a future change. You know, how do we create more space in the public right of way or on the front of properties to allow for that? So I think, you know, I think we've seen the, the benefits of having activated outdoor space, you know, even the North Common or the section of the town common downtown, we put a few benches and um, picnic tables there and they're used a lot, you know, and that's something just, you know, they're not, it's not fancy, but it shows us that people are, you know, they want to be outside. So I think that's a consideration we have, um, you know, and I think what we're doing with the mixed use buildings is really trying to address the building and not the site, right? So we're also looking at hiring a consultant for design guidelines that may get into some of the site design that you, you mentioned in terms of outdoor space. So, you know, originally this had design guidelines and it seemed that those design guidelines are better addressed at a district level or a zoning district level and not a building level. Um, so they're, you know, they're still under consideration. Thank you, Nate. Dorothy. Okay. So I'm following up some of the things Shalini has been asking, which is um, non-residential activities on floors other than the first floor. And I was just thinking about how we, we lack those old factory buildings. Um, thinking about the, place in East Hampton where I would take my grandkids to circus classes, which we would take an elevator up to, I think the third floor. And um, just wondering if in fact we could have, because uh, you didn't even mention physical activity and art in your list of non-residential uses. But when we talk about an active downtown that where people want to go, um, we, we do sometimes think of experiences that people could have. Um, and I'm just wondering if perhaps it could work out that, um, cheaper rents could be offered to some of those places to help people reach their 40% of non-residential on the first floor. Um, but the, the other thing is it's a question, I haven't totally wrapped my head around it. The last time I knew people were counting parking as a business use and that was allowing them to meet their mixed use term. 
Now parking has become its own thing. The idea, I'm just wondering, I mean, I guess I thought that people did parking inside their building because they thought they needed some parking and they could make some money and that would count towards their, um, their business use as opposed to their non-residential use. Do you think people are going to want to do parking inside their buildings if they don't have to do it to get that percentage? Um, you know, I, I'm just kind of puzzled by that change. And I, I don't really have, I feel that somehow things have changed a lot, but I don't know the implications. And I'm wondering if you've kind of done some work on what the implications could be in counting parking, not as a business, but as a non-residential activity. Nate? Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, the idea of what experiences people have downtown is a really good one. That's something the bid has mentioned that, you know, um, you know, re you know, whether or not we think retail can come back, you know, experiences, whether it's dining, right, art, music, right. Um, you know, billiards, um, stages, you know, theater, you know, music, all that would be um, considered non-residential. And we're not prohibiting that. Um, and it can happen. I think the difficulty is that the, um, I think, right, I think that the rent that would be expected, you know, on a square foot um, basis for commercial space, there may not be uses right now that could meet the expected rent that a developer would charge. And so as it is now, the residential uses are subsidizing the commercial or non-residential spaces. And so, um, you know, right, I think, I think that gets, you know, so zoning can't address that, right? What is the market? What is the rent? I agree. Maybe if expectations don't change, you know, are there other ways in terms of, um, you know, other strategies, whether it's taxes or financing or things that could help with that? I think that's, you know, outside kind of a zoning, a zoning piece. Um, and to the parking, I, I think, yeah, we, we made parking a separate use because there was concern that some, that a developer could use parking to try to satisfy the non-residential space and what you end up getting is not really um, a good balance of not you know not of non-residential uses other than parking and so in some communities they address the parking piece and a lot of the communities I looked at they're somewhat silent on it and I think um, uh, you know parking is interesting we're talking about parking enclosed within a building so there's still the ability to do site parking um, on a lot and then you know there's also um, you know, there's on-street parking or, or other ways to, you know, shared parking is allowed in the zoning bylaw. So I do think we have discussed the parking piece and it was something to look at, you know, we were looking at what other communities were doing. Um, you know, for this bylaw, the idea that it is its own piece is to try to really minimize how much parking there could be, um, you know, to try to create residential and not, you know, non-residential space on the first floor. So it's, it's, you know, or within a building? I, th I think it's a really good question. Um, you know, we had thought that if this wasn't in place, um, you know, the 2016 amendment also looked at it is that we could have essentially a first floor that may have some, you know, commercial retail, whatever, but then all parking. And maybe that's not the worst thing. They still can do the 4060. It's just, you know, um, is it also important to have a balance of residential too on the first floor, so. Thank you, Nate. Janet. I, I, for, I forgot to say earlier that I'm actually happy to be working on this mixed use. Um, it's, I think it's very close to being done. The zoning subcommittee was working on a, a revisions to mixed use two years ago. We were asked to stop working on it. And so two years later, here we are. Um, I do like, I think the draft has been well reworked and I do have, I think we should push it up to 60% at least. Um, we've lost tw 12 to 15 businesses, small businesses downtown, not to a failure of the economy or retail, but because they were just, the buildings were torn down. Um, we've just lost three other buildings, um, including the pub, which, you know, not only was it a great place to go, it was a really good community supporter of a lot of events. And so these places closed, not because they wanted to, but because they had to. And so I really, I really don't want to dwell on the death of retail when Hadley is booming, when my East Amherst is booming, um, you know, everything over in Potwine is occupied with, you know, a fair amount of residential, but not much. And so I do want to boost, boost for 60% at least, but I also really want to know is, has anybody talked to the small businesses about what they would like to see? Do they need more space downtown? Do they want smaller spaces? Um, 
you know, because the bid is one thing and the developers and the property owners are another. Um, we our downtown is full of businesses that are operating right now. And so, you know, what do they want? What do the small businesses need? Do they need small space? Do they need more space? Would they like to see mixed use requiring 60% or 70%? Did the CRC talk to them or do an impact thing or anything like that? So just looking for some more information by people directly affected. Thank you. Do you have any response, Nate? Uh, no, no I, we, you know, we didn't talk directly to the businesses. Thank you. We're going to now move on to questions from the public. And should I, should I stop sharing my screen or just, you know, uh, what do we think about that? Yes, let's stop sharing the screen for now. Okay. Um, Shalini, we will come back to you um, after public. Um, so we're going to move on to questions. After questions from the public will be the opportunity for the public to speak in favor or opposition to the revision. But this time is specifically for questions. So we're going to recognize Pam Rooney at this point. Please unmute yourself and state your name. Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Um, now that you have pushed forward the apartment uh, bylaw that actually discourages its its utilization in the business general district, um, that it feels like it's even more important than before that we get, uh, that we affect um, the utilization of the commercial space that we are trying to create. Um, and it feels very important. I, I understand with the wording that no more than 60% of the gross floor area shall be residential, that clearly there's flexibility in that, but I believe that we should switch those around where it is really no more than 40% of the gross floor area shall be residential and a minimum of 60% of the gross floor area shall be the commercial and retail. In fact, if you, I, I a really overused phrase, but if you don't build it, they actually can't even come. Um, the diagram that uh, Maureen Pollock uh, provided uh, actually could easily become a 60% commercial or retail and 40% uh, residential on that ground floor. And clearly there would be residential above it. So even at 60% commercial, 40% residential, it still works very well. Thanks. Thank you, Pam. Hilda, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, sorry, Hilda, I think you can speak now or. Okay, now I've got it, okay. My question is, I thought this was a public hearing and I'm hearing a great resistance from hearing what the public wants to say. And since there were so many places where people offered suggestions for compromise, it seems to be to me that these bylaws may still be in the process of editing and revision. And I really think that the public needs to have an opportunity, number one, if we're gonna call ourselves an open government, which you guys who wanted the council so badly thought that we, we needed, to have open government so the people can be heard, that you, I think you ought to give us an opportunity to be heard and not close public hearings while things are still in transition. So my question is, maybe can you possibly consider reopening the public hearing once these articles are finished before they go to the council so that we talk or you just don't give a damn what we think and it's just public window dressing. That, so that's the question. Will we have a chance to comment and have our comments listened to or you just don't care? It's sounding like you don't care. And I'm, I'm responding, I'm getting lots of, of, uh, of texts from various people who are thinking the same way. Why well, bother sitting through these long meetings and you guys do what you wanna do and they don't give a shit about us. Pardon my, my language, but, but I mean, I'm, I'm with Dorothy. Why bother wasting so many people's time? You guys spend more time in a week at meeting than town meetings spend in a whole year. And there was more discussion and more knowledge and more people informed with town meeting than is happening over the last three years. And I'm really getting upset about this. And nobody wants to run to be in this stupid government because it's, 
it's all controlled by one pack and nobody else it gets listened to. So will we have a chance to be listened or you don't care? That's the question. Hilda, thank you for your question. Um, we have public hearings for every single one of these bylaw revisions. But you closed it. Hilda? You closed the public hearing. Hilda, you need to stop talking right now and let me respond. And you need to respect the rules of the council, which I'm going to go over right now. We have public hearings for each of these refusal revisions. And we always at both planning board and at CRC meetings and at town council meetings take public comment. The hearings are meant to be hearing of what the public thinks. We are doing that right now. And then the both committees will go back and deliberate and it is entirely possible that the proposals will be modified prior to getting to town council. And it is entirely possible that the proposals will get modified at town council. I need to ask all participants to respect the rules and obey the rules of the council um, that require that discourse at meetings shall be marked by courtesy, openness, and respect in the face of disagreement, that discussion is centered on the agenda, and shall not use unbecoming or abusive language, and that participants shall avoid discussing personalities and not impugn the motive, character, or integrity of any individual. If anyone violates that provision again, they will be stopped and refuse to be recognized again because these are the rules that need to be abided by. We are going to hear from Kathy Shane next. Um, I think you're asking, I'm Kathy Shane, 519 Montague Road, um, speaking as a resident. Um, I am seconding the views that uh, are asking why not 50% or 60%. And I did understand the answers in terms of a discussion with those who have been building apartments um, above the floor and what they can do downstairs. But I think necessity is the mother of invention here. If you want to build the large buildings, you can be very creative with the space. Um, and there are pop-up stores, the kinds of things Shalini's talking about are happening all over New York and other cities, very small spaces with flexible space. And the those who want to build mixed use buildings where they're looking for long term residents have an incentive to do that because it's what keeps a long term resident living in, in the building. They love it. They want to go downstairs. So it's just a um, I think we should be considering at least 50 or 60 percent. The other comment question is you've there's been a lot of discussion of what about the building has a very small frontage on the main street. Again, um, thinking about what cities and small towns can be, alleyways that are wide enough for people to walk in provide storefronts all along the alleyway. If you think of where uh, the shoe repair person is or where Ben and Jerry's used to be or Panda East, it's, it's a public way that isn't a street, but it's long and narrow in terms of the frontage on our main street, but it creates a lot of life. So some of these buildings, if they had a wider side, um, could easily have retail, interesting commercial, um, some of my favorite in small cities, uh, cafes and music venues are on these small side streets or side alleyways along a building, not just on the main street. So I don't think it's inhibiting if a building has small frontage, but a long depth. It just needs to plan accordingly on um, bringing people back along there. Um, we've seen it in Amherst, you see it in Northampton. If you go up to Greenfield, I can name, Burlington has wonderful little side streets like this. So. I don't think we should worry that um, some building scopes can't handle it. So uh, otherwise, I like a lot what this is doing. I think we've needed standards for mixed use. Um, it's very important that we have them. And that's why I've worried about the apartment building one. Um, you you want to have an incentive to bring this kind of building to the downtown and village centers and not have just large buildings with nothing, no shops in them whatsoever. So I think we need to think about how these two interact. I think this is a strong move forward. And that's it for my comments. Thank you, Kathy. At this time, we're gonna move on to public speaking in favor of the revision. Please raise your hand if you would like to speak in favor of this revision.
Seeing none, we're going to move on to public speaking in opposition of this proposal and revision. Please raise your hand if you would like to speak in opposition. Pam Rooney. Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, Councillor Shane spoke much more articulate, articulately than I did, um, but I think I think we do really need to push for having no more than 40% of the gross floor area be be residential. I think there are a lot more opportunities to encourage the kind of side street, and no matter what the no matter what the site configuration is, I think most sites have lots of variation and variability in providing access. I would like to, to push hard for that original uh, town meeting um, target, which is the minimum of 60% of the gross floor area being non-residential. Non Other than that, I do appreciate that a standard is being developed and appreciate that we do want to move away from those buildings with, you know, the two and three percent commercial space and the rest residential. That they are, in my mind, essentially apartment buildings, um, and we've just spoken about them. So thanks for all the hard work, but let's let's keep the percentage of commercial up there, where we actually can. It gives us some flexibility um, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Janet Keller, please unmute yourself, identify your name, state your name and where you live. My name is Janet Keller. Um, I live at 120 Pulpit Hill Road. Um, I would like to add my voice to those um, appreciating the standards and as well to strongly recommend for 60% commercial um, and uh, cite what's going on at North Square in North Amherst. And if you haven't been out there um, to visit it, um, it's, uh, they've done a fabulous job with the space they have and um, are continuing to add to it. Um, and it is indeed very lively um, and varied and creative. Um, and uh, I think it's very important to bringing life, uh, uh, yes. So I, I just want to add my voice to those recommending that. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Jennifer Tapp, please unmute yourself, state your name and where you live. Uh, Jennifer Taub, uh, 259 Lincoln Avenue. And I actually wanted to echo what Janet Keller just said. Um, just because uh, I know I'm, I'm often made sometimes seem like I'm the voice of no, but um, I, uh, I've i been frequent, um, you know, quite a lot. And I think it's terrific as well. And so I would also echo those who have encouraged more retail space. I would prefer to see it 60% in mixed use buildings. And if downtown could have, um, you know, the commercial activity that seems like is happening in North Amherst, I think that would be terrific. So I think that, you know, if you have um, retail establishments that, that serve the public, um, people will come. So that's all I wanna say, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. At this time, would any planning department members, Nate, do you have anything to add before we move back to questions from the boards and committees? Uh, thanks, yeah, nothing to add at this time. Thank you. I'm gonna recognize Shalini because she had her hand up before we move to questions from the public. Shalini, did you have a question? Oh, it was actually a comment in response to um, Janet about um, how we, has the CRC done, um, spoken to businesses and I would just say that I've spoken to a few and uh, it it is challenging to do rent in Amherst and um, I mean we've had the blue marble space and some of those spaces that have been vacant so it's not just a question like if we build they will come because it has been hard to rent out there are a lot of empty spaces 
besides the ones that we've lost. And so it is a complex issue. Um, North Amherst, in, indeed, they've done an amazing job. And at the same time, it is challenging and they have to work so hard to get people to come to the general store and whatnot. So please do go there. Uh, the other thing is like, I do feel it would be, I think the developers, what I understood from talking to some people was they do do a market analysis, right? Of what kind of retail will be coming. And, and so it's not just arbitrarily that we are deciding numbers like that. But the fact is that in Amherst and the way things are, it the market analysis is being done by people who put in that money and the investment. So they are doing a lot of that. And the question is really for us to be thinking creatively rather than blaming each other or any of that, uh, really put our minds into what can we do to support local businesses? What can we do to work with the developers to make it feasible for them to support small businesses? But how do we all work together? Thank That's you, all. Shalini. Evan, question? Yeah, um, so North Square has been brought up twice now, and I think that's an interesting example. And it was one I was hoping on the list of um, the breakdown that was provided that that would be on there, but unfortunately it wasn't one of them um, because that's definitely a place where all of the frontage on Coles Road and all of the buildings surrounding the green is commercial, but then because of the shape of one of the buildings, it actually has quite a bit of first floor residential. I'd be curious actually in that one building that has that weird shape if it meets the 40 percent um, because there's the general store, the art gallery, and then everything behind it is first floor residential and incidental use. So I'd be curious to know if that would, if, if the one that the two commenters cited actually would meet the 40 percent, which leads to my actual question, which is there's two buildings there. One of them has a whole lot more first floor commercial. One of them has a whole lot more first floor residential, when you're looking at a project, is it, is that's, I, my assumption has been it's 40% per building of growth floor area, but I want to confirm that because if you had a development like North Square where there are two buildings that have different percentages of commercial, is it overall growth floor develop, uh, first floor growth floor area, sorry, in the first floor, or is it by building? Nate. Thanks. It, it's by building, um, not by project. I think, you know, I, the difference may be that um, if it was by project, you still have 40%. It's just maybe then you could put it all in one building as opposed to having it be broken up by two buildings. So, um, you know, there's a few communities that do have it by, you, know, you can do a vertical mixed use horizontal and some have it by district or by project. So, um, you know, almost like the 40R, right? The affordability could be in a building or overall by district, but the way we're defining the mixed uses by building. So it'd be 40% in each building. Um, I will say that North Square, we can get those percentages. I think the thing there is that's a comprehensive permit. So, you know, it was um, considered and conceived as one project with waivers from the zoning. And so, um, you know, I think they, they right, that was a, a pretty comprehensive look at what, what uh, how much commercial, you know, 22,000 square feet of commercial with, you know, 130 units. And so, you know, I, I don't know what the breakdown is, but, you know, they thought that that amount of, you know, residential to non-residential space would work. Um, I know that there has been some difficulty renting the spaces there. Um, I'm not sure for whatever reason, but, um, you know, it's been, um, you know, it's been a few years and they're still not fully occupied. So I think, um, but I do think it's a really nice example of kind of a development that had, you know, a lot of pieces to it. Thank you, Nate. Um, Dorothy, do you have a question? Because we're still on questions. Yes, that's a question. Um, so this is for Nate. Um, I know that the, the North Square had some kind of a tax break, uh, I guess maybe 10 years with a reduced tax. Does any of that um, help the commercial spaces? I, what I'm getting at is we all say that we want some commercial spaces and we want experiences, we want interesting things. And I, I know they're working very hard to create that uh, in the Mill District. But if we're thinking of downtown, uh, are there any incentives that the town can offer to try to create those? And I'm, I'm putting this particularly in terms of art and experiences, all right? 
um, places that need space that people would come and stay for a couple of hours, do something interesting, and then they would go. They wouldn't spend too much money and the people who run it don't make very much money, but we would love it. Uh, is there, so that's the question. Any, anything that we as a town can do to encourage that? Yeah, I think, you know, North Square, the, the tax incentive was for the affordable units. And so, um, you know, in the way that was developed in terms of ownership, um, it doesn't necessarily benefit the, you know, the commercial space. You know, if if ownership and financing were different in terms of, you know, what, what entities did what, you know, if it was like the same entity, then maybe it would, right, because they're getting a break on their residential, even though their commercial rent hasn't been, uh, you know, abated or something. But for North Square, it's a little different. Um, you know, in terms of what the town can do, I, you know, I don't have an answer. I think those are good questions in terms of, you know, other non-zoning measures. So what are some incentives? You know, I think we have some things in place. Um, you know, I think even like ease of permitting is one. So, you know, allowing things by site plan or view uh, is an incentive. Um, you know, having flexibility in the zoning in terms of uh, dimensional standards is another one. So when we were looking at, you know, inclusionary zoning, amendment, we said, well, we actually have some flexibility in our zoning in terms of lot coverage. And I know, uh, you know, the footnote A can be problematic, as Hilda pointed out, but it can also be flexible in the downtown where we want uh, different size buildings and density and site layout. It can allow for creativity. Um, but in terms of actual financing pieces, that's something that's completely different than, you know, zoning or land use. But I think it's a good question to ask, you know, is it a compendium to the zoning? You know, what else can we do as a community uh, for, you know, to encourage you know downtown businesses and non-residential space. Thank you, Nate. I am not seeing any other hands right now, so I will entertain a motion from the planning board to. I'm going to assume it might be a closed hearing, but um, regarding the hearing, is there anyone who would like to make a motion? Andrew, make a motion to close the hearing. Second. And that was Johanna seconding it. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'm going to go to a roll call. Um, I'm going to go backwards on my list. Tom. Yes. Andrew. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Janet. Aye. Doug. Aye. Jack. Yes. That is unanimous. The hearing for the planning board is closed. Um, at this time, I will entertain a motion from the CRC. I'll move to close the hearing. There's a motion to close the hearing from Evan. Is there a second? Second, Shalini. Shalini makes the second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll roll call. Um, we start with Mandy. Mandy is an aye. Uh, Dorothy. Aye. Uh, Evan. Aye. Melanie. Yes. That is a unanimous with one absent. Planning board was also unanimous with one absent. So the hearing is closed. Planning board and CRC will set their dates for when they discuss the and deliberate on their recommendations um, at some point. Um, Jack will come up with a date for the planning board and CRC tends to try and wait until the planning board has made their recommendations. At this point, we're gonna move on to the next hearing. It is 9.29 PM and in accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 40A, this joint public hearing of the Amherst Planning Board and the Community Resources Committee of the Amherst Town Council has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw. Zoning bylaw article five accessory uses section 5.011 supplemental dwelling units. To see if the town will vote to amend Article 5, Accessory Uses, Section 5.011, Supplemental Dwelling Units, to repeal the existing Section 5.011, Supplemental Dwelling Units, and replace it with a new Section 5.011, Accessory Dwelling Units. To change the name of this use, ca use category to Accessory Dwelling Units, to increase the maximum square footage allowed per unit to 1,000 square feet, to create a more streamlined permitting pathway, to add design guidelines and to require that the principles and standards of the design review board be applied to all new accessory dwelling units. 
We will follow the same process we have followed before. Are there any board and committee member disclosures? Seeing none, um, Nate, is it you doing this presentation? It's, uh, oh, I'm, I'm gonna be doing it, yeah. Thank <laughs> I've you. seen ben, Ben's got his mic off, Ben. Yeah, hi there. Well, thank you all. Um, I'm Ben Breger, a planner in the planning department. Um, so I guess I just wanted to do a start by saying, um, you know, for accessory dwelling units, I just want to, you know, shift everyone's focus a little bit. We've been talking a lot about large buildings, uh, apartments and mixed use buildings, mostly in downtown areas, but uh, accessory dwelling units are uh, much different. So we're just kind of, you know, shifting topics here, mostly uh, accessory dwelling units are um, associated with owner occupied single family homes in all of Amherst's residential districts, uh, except for the uh, RF. So we're kind of focused on Amherst's uh, single family neighborhoods here, um, just for a shift in reference. Um, and just want to make sure you can see my screen okay. Thumb, yes, thumbs up. Um, so just going through the uh, bylaw proposal, and uh, this is the same pres similar presentation I've given to CRC planning board and uh, lastly to town council, I think at the end of May. Um, so it will be familiar. Um, but just briefly a, a reminder, so we're all on the same page, what are accessory dwelling units? Um, ADUs are small dwelling units or apartments that exist on the same property lot as uh, a single owner occupied single family residence. Um, these are independent living spaces with uh, equipped with a kitchen, bath and sleeping area. Um, as the diagram shows, they can be associated with the single family home in any different kind of many different ways. They can be fully detached, they can be attached. Um, and when they're attached, they can be above, below, um, uh, above the garage. Um, so there's different, or they can be sit on like fully contained within the uh, the single family home, um, such as in the basement. Um, so these they go by many different names: carriage houses, backyard bungalow, granny flats, in law suite. So um, all these terms uh, do mean the same thing. Um, just a few examples of accessory, or sorry. Uh, just a little bit about the bylaw in Amherst and how it's been working in the past. Um, I will I will note in 2018, there was a bylaw proposal put forth uh, to, to increase the supplemental detached dwelling unit to a maximum of 1,000 square feet um, and 1,100 for ADA accessible units. Um, this uh, proposal did receive unanimous support from the planning board, uh, noting that it creates a wider variety of living arrangements, such as two or three bedroom units. You know, this would benefit young families looking for rental units in neighborhood settings, um, and also allows the owners of larger, you know, single family homes to downsize and, you know, stay in the same neighborhood that they love, um, but downsize into a smaller unit and rent out the, the larger home. And that frees up a single family home for a younger family possibly to move in. Um, this amendment received a majority of town meeting support, but not the two thirds required to pass. Um, my, or not my recollection, but I've heard, I wasn't there, but in, in writing and in notes, I've heard that it was, you know, wanting to uh, give that power essentially to the incoming town council to, to, to Bring about that change. Um, so that was one of the main reasons it didn't pass uh, the town meeting at the time. Um, just briefly, the Amherst Master Plan, the Housing Production Plan, and the Housing Market Study, all done in the past 10 years, uh, also uh, speak to the proposal that we're putting forth today. Um, the Master Plan talks about making it easier to create attached and detached accessory apartments. Uh, the Housing Production Plan talks about, you know, making uh, supplemental dwelling units by right, adding design guidelines, reducing parking requirements, and the housing market study also supports the idea of allowing them by right in all residential zoning districts. Um, and then just briefly, I just want to give you a sense of what we're talking about and how ADUs have been built in Amherst. Um, here's an example on Beston Street for a 420 square foot studio. You can kind of see it at the end of the garage here. Um, 
the uh, on Logtown Road, a 900 square foot um, three bedroom accessory dwelling unit. Uh, and this one is just to show that, you know, they're actually, this is technically a, a I guess it, well, there's a, an accessory dwelling unit in the basement here. So just showing that they, to build an ADU, it doesn't have to be a, a fully new structure. They can, it can really blend into an existing neighborhood. Uh, the basement here uh, contains a fully, um, a fully equipped kitchen, bath, bedroom, uh, and living space. So it's not uh, something that always will add a new structure to the to a neighborhood. Um, and lastly, the uh, the grist mill on, on Mill Lane here has uh, a 540 square foot one bedroom ADU in the front. Um, so they can be retrofitted into historic buildings as well and not change the appearance all, all that much. Um, and so finally, that brings us to what we're proposing today. Um, the, uh, you know, the purpose, the goals of this bylaw proposal, um, recognizing that ADUs are an important tool to meet the dynamic housing needs of Amherst residents. Um, ADUs allow a lot of flexibility in terms of, you know, different living arrangements, having, uh, uh, if for those who need assistance, having um, an in-house in uh, aid or nurse, you know, live in the accessory dwelling unit to help out or to have uh, family um, live uh, in the ADU or vice versa. Um, it allows flexibility um, and also allows people to generate rental income. Um, so what we're proposing is to uh, increase the maximum square footage of all three types of accessory dwelling units, create a more streamlined permitting pathway, and then adding additional design guidelines. Um, so we're proposing to increase the maximum square footage for all three types, attached, detached, and contained to 1,000 square, square feet, um, streamlining the permitting pathway uh, such that um, there's options to build all three uh, by right, um, adding design guidelines, and then also just simplifying the bylaw structure to make it easier to interpret. So uh, one you know minor thing is you've noticed I've been using supplemental and accessory interchangeably. Uh, I'm proposing to just be consistent and use the word accessory dwelling units. That's more in line with how other towns, states uh, refer to these structures. And uh, certainly the state uh, of Massachusetts has, uh, with the recent housing choice uh, uh, legislation has uh, doubled down on promoting accessory dwelling units, um, increasing the maximum square footage for all three types to 1000 square feet, um, allowing attached and contained accessory dwelling units by right, um, and then for detached accessory dwelling units, allowing them by right, if they are less than 50% of the square footage of the primary structure. And if they're larger than 50%, uh, then this would require a, a special permit from the ZBA, which is the current pathway. And really the point of that is that accessory dwelling units are meant to be accessory to the primary structure. Um, they're smaller, they, uh, are meant to appear smaller and be, uh, you know, as as is the what they're called accessory. And so, I think the point of that provision um, is to retain a little bit more control over how they look and how they're placed, and allow more neighborhood input um, for accessory detached accessory dwelling units that begin to approach the size of the primary home. Um, so you're not getting too uh, uh, t essentially two nearly single family homes on, on a property. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, if, if they're larger than 50% of the primary structure, that could just, that could be a, a ZBA special permit. And again, they could make that an attached accessory dwelling unit, just attach it to the house. Um, and that would be allowed by right. But if it's a fully detached unit, um, a ZBA special permit would be required. Um, and then just adding language for the permit granting authority and the building commissioner to use in the in approval, um, adding design guidelines to encourage that the architecture and scale of detached ADUs are compatible and, and secondary to the primary structure. 
So here's a chart just showing the proposed change summary. Um, the bold language is the new language and the gray language is the old, older language. So just so you can see the updates to the terminology, you know, we're moving away from supplemental apartment one, two, and saying contained, attached, and detached. We're moving, uh, we're getting rid of the minimum square footage and increasing the max to 1,000 square feet for each um, type of ADU and then allowing contained and attached by right and detached uh, by right if it's less than 50% and special permit if more than 50%. Uh, here's just some resources for those who are interested in learning more. Um, and thank you. I will just briefly show the, uh, the bylaw proposal. This is the memo um, describing the change. So here's the existing bylaw and I, I, we've, we've discussed this at previous meetings, but it was such an overhaul of the bylaw um, that it was, it got really messy doing the track changes. So we're proposing kind of a, a repeal and replace of the new section. Um, and so it's, I, I didn't do what my colleagues did showing the, the crossed out text, um, but it, this is the old bylaw um, and, and the proposal uh, I'll, I'll just go through that briefly. Um, it's it's section five accessory uses, and then 5.0011 accessory dwelling units. Um, you know, it does say clearly uh, only one accessory dwelling unit shall be permitted to accessory as a one family detached dwelling. So we're, there's only one allowed per single family home. Um, you know, the contained accessory dwelling unit uh, is fully contained within the um, within the house. It's permitted uh, in all residential districts except the RF. Um, following review of the proposed accessory use by the building commissioner and verification that it meets the bylaw and general requirements. Um, that's the same language that you see for attached accessory dwelling unit, um, which is uh, attached to, to uh, and involves significant changes to the existing one family detached dwelling. Uh, including fire news, fire escapes, additions, and other similar changes. And then finally, detached accessory dwelling units are small freestanding accessory, one family uh, a detached dwelling that co-occur in a residential property um, as a result of new construction uh, or rehabilitation. And so a detached accessory dwelling unit resulting from new construction uh, greater than 50% is allowed by a special permit. I went over that and then less than 50% um, through the building commissioner. And so all of all three of these need to meet the general requirements listed below, um, many of which are taken from the old bylaw. Um, so again, only one ADU, uh, there should not be more than 1000 square feet of habitable space. So that's the maximum square footage. Uh, one of the dwelling units on the property shall be owner occupied. Um, so either the ADU or the single family owner of the single family residence. Um, yeah, not, not used for accessory lodging. That's a holdover from the previous bylaw. Um, three unrelated residents uh, is where we landed on that. Um, I think it was three adults in the previous bylaw. Um, meeting the definition of a dwelling unit. Uh, providing a management plan, um, rent, yeah, rental registration bylaw, uh, something, a, kind of a design uh, thing to the extent feasible, newly constructed detached ADU shall be located behind the front building line of the primary structure. To the, so the, to the extent possible, we'd like to see them behind the primary structure rather than in the front yard. Um, adequate parking shall be provided, um, exterior lighting, dark sky compliant, you know, storage of management of waste, street address sign. Um, this is, it's, it's a lot of different requirements, uh, many of which are held over from the previous bylaw. Um, and finally, the ADU shall be designed so that the appearance and scale of the building is compatible with the primary single family dwelling. Um, detached ADU shall be clearly accessory. Um, the building commissioner or the permit granting authority uh, determines kind of whether section 10.38, which I believe are the special permit findings are applicable. Um, new entrances shall be located on the side or rear of the building. And finally, the design review 
principles uh, shall be applied to all accessory uses under this section. So the design review principles are fairly uh, robust and do provide for a lot of consideration of aesthetics uh, in the neighborhood, the site, and the, the architecture itself. So um, that is the new proposed uh, bylaw and um, kind of stop there and open it up for any questions. I'll, uh, I guess, keep it open uh, on here to uh, easily reference the new language. Thank you, Ben. Um, questions from the board and committee are what we're on now. Dorothy. Well, I'm going to say what I'm sure many of you were thinking, which is that this is pretty nearly finished and ready to go. Um, but I have two questions. When you say um, you can, it can't be more than 50% bigger than the original house, unless you get a special permit. I'm wondering if you added the sentence, uh, but not to exceed 75%. Um, in other words, not just saying, okay, if you've got a special permit, you can really make it bigger. Because I think that leaves the door, this is very tightly written. I think that might leave the door open a little too wide. Um, and the other thing I thought about was the question of parking, um, which was not addressed when I first heard, came, went to a meeting on this in, in 2018, I think it was. And the reason parking comes up is that somebody who wants to try to build a really big accessory dwelling in the backyard could take space that perhaps would have been just needed for a, a, one parking spot or something. Um, and I, I don't know how to, I, I'm not suggesting words because this is, I don't have them at this moment, but somehow the decision to go bigger than 50% um, should be adequate parking on site should be considered in there before somebody gets permission to go beyond the 50%. And beyond that, I don't have any other, I have no other problems with this. I think you've really done a very closely written piece. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's an interesting suggestion about putting a, a, a cap 50 to 75% um, as something that's considered. Um, I, and as for parking, what we have in there now is, you know, adequate parking shall be provided to ensure proper maneuverability and parking on paved surfaces. So that um, leaves it up to the uh, building commissioner or the permit granting authority to kind of determine what is adequate um, parking mean and look like. So, um, and, you know, that takes into account the square footage of the accessory dwelling unit, the site, and also, you know, proximity to, you know, the downtown, the university, public transportation. Um, and I think uh, that's kind of where we ended up with that. So. Thank you, Ben. Um, I think I'll also note that our next public hearing has an right. EDU section to the parking proposal. Um, so we'll hear about that in half an hour or so, or maybe less. Um, Janet. So um, we've seen this before, like we saw mixed use and um, so I'm feeling much more comfortable with it. Um, I do wanna comment that uh, the same comment I made in writing for the demolition delay bylaw is that when you change who's deciding, making the decision and the process for decision making, that's a huge difference. And I think we need to highlight that whenever that happens. So it's a big thing to go from a, a special permit, you know, from the ZBA or a site plan review from the planning board to a decision by the building commissioner. And so I think in presentations to the public or anything, it's, you have to highlight that because Lots of things change. Um, so my concerns I've had with this the whole time is the size of the ADUs, like a thousand square feet to 1100 is on the big side. Like Amherst has been a leader in, you know, the 800 and 900 square foot, foot one. Um, we're a leader in, you know, multiple, you know, unit housings and stuff like that. And I, I do wonder in, I live in a, I live in a neighborhood of mostly thousand square foot homes. And so I think about the impact of that on the lot next to me um, and things. So I also am concerned about that, you know, people who do have smaller homes, you know, and presumably less resources have a more expensive, diff difficult path than going for a, a building permit 
or a site plan review permit from the building commissioner. And so, um, so I just, I just, it's just going to be harder, you know, and it's going to probably cost them a lot more. And so I'm worried about that. And then I'm also really worried about, you know, like what happens when you're in, you have a home in a residential neighborhood and the first you hear of the, the ADU next door is when someone comes in with a bulldozer or an excavator. And so, you know, with a, with a special permit or a site plan review permit, abutters get notified and they have a, an ability to participate in the process and then challenge the decision. And so for all the ADU decisions that go to the building commissioner, there is no notice requirement. Um, I don't think there's any, you know, there's no information going to abutters. It's not clear to me how long the process takes. You, you can appeal a building permit, but you'd have to know that the permit was issued. And so um, that's a big concern for me of just, you know, notifying the neighborhood and people that, you know, what's happening next door and having some ability to do some input in it. And so I just wondered, you know, um, I mean, I'm sort of a comment more than anything. And I do want to present later um, an amendment. I would like to show the CRC and the planning board that we don't have to hash out tonight, but it's an amendment language, like a notification requirement to abutters so that at least they know what the process is and what's going on. Thank you for that, Janet. I believe um, that amendment has been distributed, but for the benefit of the public, we're not going to deliberate on it tonight, um, mm -hmm. but can Pam put it on the screen? I think she might be ready to put it on the screen just so the public can see what yeah, and I, I would be very, when it gets to deliberation. I'd be interested in comments on it because it, you know, it's it's always helpful when you're cooking something up to have a lot of eyes on it. So we will take questions regarding the potential amendment. Um, I I think it's the second. No, it's neither of those. This is parking. Yeah, that's the parking one. So it's the other one. And we'll just leave it up um, so people can just read it. There, the planning board and board can ask questions about it, and so can the public during the questions period. Can we uh, enlarge that, Pam? <laughs> it's in the bottom right, Pam. It's the bottom right. Yeah. A little plus down there. Hopefully that's large enough. Um, Tom. In terms of comments, it's just a quick comment is the draft that I have just has a typo in the first sentence in regard to um, the uh, permit for um, supplemental dwelling units. Um, it has a supplemental dwelling units and it probably doesn't need a or it needs to remove the S from units, so um, we're to be dramatically clear. Thank you for that, Tom. Seeing no other questions from the board or committee, we're going to leave the potential amendment that might come up during deliberations up, but we'll take questions from the public at this time. Uh, Pam Rooney. Hello, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, thanks very much. This this um, <clears throat> zoning bar article feels pretty pretty well formulated, and appreciate the work done on it. Um, a couple questions that perhaps somebody can address, uh, and this is more for the people listening. Um, if someone could kindly confirm which of these um, either contain attached or detached uh, require owner occupancy is one question. Um, again, just for those listening to confirm, uh, if a multifamily structure exists, is an ADU uh, allowed? Um, I heard both 1,000 square feet and 1,100 square feet uh, mentioned. And I think the wording now says, <clears throat> a thousand square feet uh, of habitable space, and I think that's appropriate. It didn't. It didn't feel. It didn't feel right to 
or it felt more complicated to have a range, even though it was for an accessible dwelling unit. I think there's plenty of room in a thousand square foot space, uh, even if it is accessible. Um, so again, I think, uh, and I and I appreciated the uh, the the cap on the the percentage of the original size. So fifty to seventy five percent makes some sense to me. And finally, that um, suggestion by Ms. McGowan to add a requirement for the courtesy notification, um, I would say for detached and, and attached dwelling units to the neighbors within two or 300 square feet, or two or 300 feet from the site is very, very appropriate. Um, most, most neighbors are very uh, supportive of what their uh, friends are doing, but it is just clearly a courtesy that they understand that someone is in the process of undergoing um, a fairly significant addition or construction project in their neighborhood. Um, so again, it is it is a courtesy uh, requirement, and I would like very much to um, be part of the discussion on that when you do get around to it. So I don't know if if you all decide to close this hearing, does the public actually get to um, listen into that conversation about um, notification of the butters? So thanks, that was several items. Thank you, Pam. Um, just before um, Ben addresses some of those questions, I wanna say one of the reasons I'm allowing questions on this amendment is so that those questions can be heard and the public can be um, contributing to that before those amendments are proposed since the deliberation on that won't happen until after a public hearing closes. So that's why we're leaving it up and encouraging if there are any questions on it, even though it's not part of the proposal right now that those questions be asked. Um, not waiting for me. Ben. Yeah, um, thanks. Thanks, Mandy Jo. Um, so to uh, the questions um, that were proposed. Um, so all, all three types do re require owner occupancy, uh, attached, detached, and uh, fully contained. The owner of the property needs to live in the ADU or the, the single family home. Um, also to that point, uh, this is an accessory dwelling unit can only be uh, built on the property of an existing single family home. So if you have a duplex, a triplex, um, there's no way to build an accessory dwelling unit. It's really for a single family home to build an additional unit um, on their home. Uh, and I guess, yeah, just to clarify, uh, we're proposing 1,000 square feet to be the cap uh, for all three types. Uh, the, the 2018 bylaw was 1,000 square feet or 1,100 for ADA. Uh, and we, we kind of agreed with you that 1,000 square feet does allow for a lot of flexibility. Um, and we felt that was a big enough number. Um, and yeah, I think those were the questions and I uh, certainly noted the comment about the courtesy notice, so. Thank you. Mary Sayer, please unmute yourself, state your name and where you live and then ask your question. Hi, Mary Sayer, uh, 159 Pine Street in Amherst. Um, uh, I wanted to say, I think you're doing a great job figuring this all out and I think it's a good idea. I wanted to say that pretty much Pam covered um, everything I had about the abutters. Um, the other question, when I originally looked at this, it said duplexes would only have to have a management person. They didn't have to have owner occupancy. So I'm very glad to note that there has to be an owner um, on the on the land because I think that keeps the investment in the neighborhood. And the other question I had was uh, how much land can be covered? In other words, I know there's setbacks, but um, for instance, the neighborhood of Van Meter Drive, there's, there's um, probably a couple hundred houses that are maybe only a thousand square feet. And I'm wondering what it would be like if most of their backyards are covered with another thousand square foot property. So I'm just curious about how much open space or how much yard has to be left for each unit, if, or if there's any question about that. Thank you, Mary. Um, ben. Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I guess uh, to clarify, um, you know, all, all the other 
table three dimensional regulations uh, do still come into play. So there's certainly setbacks, uh, there's maximum lot coverage and maximum building coverage that all uh, factor in that, that could uh, very well limit the size of the ADU to less than uh, 1,000 square feet. So mm -hmm. that's part of the uh, building commissioner and the permit granting authorities review is making sure the other uh, zoning uh, pieces, uh, dimensional regulations come into play. Um, the, the only thing um, that accessory dwelling units are exempt from is the additional lot area per, per, per family. Um, that, that does not, uh, is not required um, to add the ADU. You don't need to have that additional lot area, um, but you are certainly uh, do need to meet the maximum building coverage, lot coverage, um, and setback. So I don't know exactly what Van Meter Drive is. I'm guessing it might be RN. So that would, you know, 25% maximum building coverage and 40% lot coverage um, would be the maximums there. Thank you, Ben. Janet Keller, please unmute yourself and state your name and your question. Janet Keller, um, Pulpit Hill Road. And um, I, um, I have two questions. Can you explain to me again, um, please, what um, the notification to the neighborhood is? And then my other question concerns the parking. Um, do I understand correctly that you are proposing to have the building inspector uh, decide whether it is adequate and um, is that the language? And if so, can you make it less squishy? Thanks. Thank you, Janet. Ben? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so currently, um, currently uh, ADUs uh, require um, special permits. So there is um, a notification that goes out um, to abutters uh, in advance of the hearing and there's an opportunity to appeal um, because we're proposing that these uh, most uh, ADUs are allowed by right. Um, there's no kind of mechanism for uh, an abutters notice. Uh, you know, it's, it's akin to someone building a single family home by right um, or, you know, building an addition to their house. Um, you need a building permit for that, but it's not something that uh, is broadcast to the neighborhood. So, you know, obviously, you know, when you're building an ADU, there's more people coming into more people, more live uh, an additional dwelling unit, there's more people living there. So, you know, I guess there, you know, there's something to be said about notifying abutters, but uh, as of now, um, it's, uh, it's, it's treated, or it, as of now in our proposal, what the language uh, just essentially treats it as, as a building permit. Um, with design guidelines, but there's a, there's not a mechanism for notifying abutters. Um, and then to the other point, uh, it would be up to the building commissioner um, or permit granting authority to decide what adequate parking uh, means. But we, uh, I think in our subsequent next public hearing, we'll, we will discuss uh, in finer detail kind of what, how adequate parking is defined and what are the considerations. Um, Thank you. Um, Pam Rooney. Hi, Pam Rooney again. Um, Mary Sir Sayers question um, reminded me of something I wanted to ask. Uh, so, and I think hers had to do with the, the, the maximum lot coverages and the setbacks that still apply per table three. Um, we're using a lot of the section 9.22 to allow continuation of nonconformity. And I, I would guess that many of these actually would fall into that bucket because uh, especially in my neighborhood, which is quarter acre lots, um, it's pretty likely that, that uh, new construction might tip the scale on uh, you know, what's possible. Um, my understanding is though that um, even if it's a small lot, you could still build a thousand square foot 
ADU if it, if it didn't exceed that 50% of the original house. So if somebody could just clarify that, are we, we really have some flexibility because of 9.22 um, when the existing structure itself is non-conforming. If someone could clarify that, thank you. Thank you, Pam. Ben? Um, I, might, I might defer to Chris. I see Chris. she has her hands up. <laughs> Chris. So um, any use of 9.22 requires a special permit. And um, in this case, it would probably require a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals because the Planning Board isn't, uh, doesn't have a role in accessory dwelling units um, as we are uh, proposing this zoning amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, we're going to ask for people who would um, like- I was oh, just gonna okay. say Rob has his hand up as well. Oh, sorry, Rob. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I just wanted to mention that for one and two family dwellings, the 9.22 section wouldn't be used for the example that was just mentioned. So as long as the dwelling unit, the accessory dwelling unit meets the dimensional requirements and there's no new nonconformity, the existing nonconforming lot or nonconforming structure can remain. And we specifically address that in Article 9 for one and two family dwellings only. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, just making sure no one else from the planning department raises their hand. Um, with that, we're going to go to um, public speaking in favor of the revision. If you would like to speak in favor of the revision at this time, please raise your hand and you will be recognized. Pam Rooney. Hi, Pam, you can uh, speak. You should just be able to speak. Oh, okay. I didn't see my unmute uh, notification. You were already uh, unmuted. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm in favor of this. If we can, if we can add that notification clause in there and make that happen, um, I'm very happy to see um, these changes in the works. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Janet Keller. Jack Keller, Pulpit Hill Road. Um, uh, I'm okay with this and also would like to ask for the notice to abutters. Thanks. Thank you for that, Janet. Seeing no more hands, we will move to any public speaking in opposition of the revision. Please raise your hand if you'd like to speak in opposition. Seeing none, would um, anyone from the planning department like to say anything before we move to final questions from the board and committee at this point? So Rob had his hand up. Yeah, I think that was a residual hand. I had just lowered it. Rob? Yeah, okay, that was residual. Okay, any other further questions from the board or committee? Janet. I'm sorry, it's just starting to flag here. Um, so I kind of didn't really pay that much attention to the parking requirement. And um, so if I built a thousand square foot house with three bedrooms, I'd be required to put in two parking spaces. But if I build a, a thousand square foot ADU or an attached or unattached, I just have to do something adequate. And so um, I just find it really confusing, you know, with this idea, um, you know, so if you put this in here, it conflicts with language in the parking um, article, Article 7, I believe at this time of night. And so if you have this language here, you have conflicting language in our current um, parking article. And then I sort of think, why don't you just take it out? Because if you're gonna, if there is gonna be a changes to the parking article, let's do it all there. But it's just, it's very strange to me, like like situations should be treated like. And so if I had a converted dwelling, I would have to have two parking spaces. If I had, you know, you know, it's like all these different situations and it's hard for me to understand why this would be treated differently. And I also know that the parking article has a big waiver that can kind of help. And so, I didn't really think about it that much um, 
and so I just I, I just find it sort of confusing like why like things aren't being treated like and why if you had three people three college students near UMass and an ADU they're likely to have three cars you know more than you know three people in a family living together in an ADU and so I just I don't know I just it's it suddenly seems like a problem to me now that people are talking about it so I just wonder why aren't like things being treated like Ben um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, I invite Chris or Rob to speak, but I, I do know, um, you know, part of, part of the goal was to streamline the permitting pathway and just reduce barriers to, uh, building this type of flexible, uh, multi-generational housing. And, um, certainly there could be a waiver for, uh, article seven, but I think, uh, that's just one more hurdle, uh, to, to, to pass over, to go, to go through for someone trying to build um, an ADU. Um, and uh, I think that that was, that was one of the goals, um, certainly. But I, um, perhaps Rob has more to. Rob? Yeah, I just wanted to um, clarify that currently under the bylaw, the building commissioner can approve supplemental apartments that are what are you know, referred to as contained in this new version. So entirely within the building or uh, uh, accessory dwelling units that have small additions up to a certain limit. And that happens quite often. Uh, and in fact, it's usually, you know, a studio size apartment or something much smaller than a thousand square feet that's being permitted through that process. And uh, article seven or the bylaw, uh, the current bylaw article five that has the two parking space requirement cannot be waived. So by me by the building commissioner. So the what happens is that we have to um, force a property owner to build two parking spaces. Uh, otherwise they'd have to go through this zoning board special permit process just to get that reduction to one space. And oftentimes one space is probably um, more than acceptable. And what we do is condition the permit to have um, either connected to a lease or lease language that uh, limits the number of cars that can be associated with that dwelling unit. Um, very similar to what the Zoning Board of Appeals would do in, in a case where they were waiving the parking requirement. Thank you for that, Rob. Seeing no other hands and questions at this point, I will entertain a motion from a planning board member. Oh, and Pam, can we just take down the proposed amendment at this point? Andrew. Make a motion to close the hearing. Is there a second? Jack? Yeah, I'll second. Is there any further discussion on that motion? Assuming Jack's hand is a not a discussion, is a holdover, I will move to a vote um, and we'll go from the bottom up on my list again. Tom. Andrew. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Janet. Aye. Doug. Aye. And Jack. Uh, yes. That is six zero with one absent. At this time, I will entertain a motion from a CRC member. I can go. I close out proposed motion, make a motion to close the whatever. Shalini makes the motion to close the hearing. Is there a second? I second it. Dorothy seconds it. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote starting with Dorothy. Yes. Evan. Aye. Shalini. Yes. And Mandy is a yes. That is also 4-0, unanimous with one absent. We are moving on to parking um, at 10.14 PM. In accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing of the Amherst Planning Board and the Community Resources Committee of the Amherst Town Council has been duly advertised and notice thereof and 
has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw, zoning bylaw article seven, parking and access regulation. To see if the town will vote to amend article seven, parking and access regulations by amending section 7.000 to separate the residential uses into two categories, one of which would require two parking spaces per dwelling unit, one family detached dwellings, two family detached dwellings, townhouses and subdividable converted dwellings, and one of which would require adequate parking, apartments, mixed use buildings and accessory dwelling units, and to provide criteria for the permit granting authority to determine what would be considered adequate parking. Again, we will follow the same procedure. Are there any border committee member disclosures? Seeing none, um, Chris, are you the one presenting this one? No, we have Maureen back again. Maureen is back. Excellent. Maureen. Hi, everyone. More, I'm still Maureen Pollock, planner, and let's just dive into it. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, parking under Article 7 of the Zoning Bylaw, the ex existing language um, that we are going to uh, make a proposal for is uh, for dwellings, including apartments, two parking spaces for each uh, dwelling uh, shall be provided. Uh, and the proposal is uh, we, we're breaking it down for uh, parking space requirements for residential uses. So for residential uses uh, with one or more dwellings, uh, two spaces per dwelling would, would uh, need to be provided, including uh, one family uh, 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 house, uh, two family, a duplex and a subdividable converted dwelling. And so the proposal is, um, is to uh, provide uh, adequate parking for each dwelling unit um, for apartments, mixed use buildings and supplemental dwelling units. And, uh, and uh, the amount of parking spaces provided for each of the dwelling units uh, would need to be based on specific factors. Uh, and so the, these factors are for the board to know what to ask for uh, specifically and for uh, also for the applicant um, to know what to provide the the uh, the permit granting authority. So such factors include bedroom count, analysis of traffic impact reports, proximity and connectivity to downtown, public transit and or public parking, including on street and off street parking availability of alternative modes of transportation, tenant lease restrictions uh, relative to parking and shared or leased parking, which sometimes is uh, com and commonly known as uh, mid-block parking, um, where um, you have uh, different uses um, that have different uh, peak parking demands um, that share, share parking. So if you have a, a coffee shop, that people go in the you know in the morning and up to the afternoon. And then you have um, a restaurant that has more business at night. Um, that would be uh, a perfect example of uh, of sh sharing parking um, for two uses that have diff have two different parking uh, peak needs. And so again, it's to provide specific criteria for review. Uh, for determining what is adequate, or in other words, sufficient parking. And the reason why we're looking at these three uses in particular, apartment, mixed use building, and supplemental dwelling units is because those are the three uses that the planning department is looking at and studying. Um, and we're not at this time looking at any other uses. So that's why we're specifically uh, choosing these ones. And um, lastly, you know, as, as, we've shown you in slides, apartment buildings and mixed use buildings are located in our downtown and village centers, which are in um, close proximity to uh, bus stops or walkable to downtown um, and supplemental dwelling units are, you know, really geared for up to three unrelated, uh, yeah, three unrelated uh, tenants. Um, and so, um, uh, so we felt that these would be um, good uses to provide this this uh, softening of parking instead of a sort of um, generic um, number of two two parking spaces per per unit. And 
lastly, although I think I already said that, was that this doesn't mean that this doesn't mean that um, adequate means zero parking spots. This doesn't mean one parking spot or two. It's 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 up to the board to decide uh, what is adequate. So if the board says no, actually we want uh, a be uh, a car per for every bedroom in that development, then perhaps there's three parking spaces per dwelling unit. Um, so it's really at the discretion of the board and in this uh, proposal gives the uh, specific factors to help um, help that dialogue between um, the applicant and the board. And that's it. Thank you, Maureen. We will move on to questions from the board members and committee members. Janet. So I have lots of questions and I think I'm just gonna go through them because I'm afraid that we might close the hearing before I get them. Uh, my first question is, do other towns use adequate parking as a legal standard? And do they have the planning board or ZBA or whatever decide parking requirements on a case by case basis for mixed use buildings and apartments and ADUs, but no other type of multi, multi housing? Good question. So uh, I looked into um, um, uh, a few uh, communities uh, such as Northampton, Greenfield, um, and I can't think of the other one, but um, those two, uh, Northampton and Greenfield specifically, actually don't uh, require parking in their downtown uh, for apartments and mixed use buildings. Um, so Northampton does require parking for assembly uses such as um, like museums or um, a music hall or a nightclub. Um, but uh, as, as I've said before, apartments and mixed use buildings um, are in the downtown are, are allowed um, by, by, you know, uh, special permit site planning review in downtown or village centers. Um, adequate? Yeah, um, you know, we use the word adequate um, so, in, in our current zoning bylaw for a variety of different things. So I, I would say that if we're allowed to use the word adequate in other uh, sections in the zoning bylaw, I, I don't see any legal um, legal concerns. So, So there aren't any other towns that you know that just do case by case using that term. So I've looked at a lot of different parking requirements um, and usually towns do it based on unit size, square footage, zoning district, distance to a subway stop that is usually tying into a major metropolitan area, the number of bed bedrooms. Um, some, you know, have less requirements for low income. So, you know, I, I just find this whole thing sort of just I don't know where this parking change came from, but it, it's, I don't know, I, you know, I heard at the town council saying, well, the planning board has been debating this at, you know, many hearings, we've done it twice. And then the idea that we have to debate it at every hearing or half the hearings um, just makes literally no sense to me. And so I guess another question I have is why can't the parking waiver suffice? Cause it did in those cases for the planning board. And well, can we can we pull oh, up the language of the waiver because it talks about shared spaces. It talks about the needs of tenants. Um, you know, it's, I mean, the, the waiver covers it. And I think if the waiver is not clear enough, we should just work on the waiver. But can we just bring up the waiver language, which you haven't provided anywhere? Um, I think so Jan, what, you have that as part of so, just the first page, I think, of what Janet provided. So why is case by case decision making on a vague term going to help us, you know, our, our process? Well, to uh, I'll try to answer your question, which is, you know, it comes down uh, a lot of this, which you'll notice is it comes down to the site specifics. Where is it located? Um, and as you can see, the, the list of criteria that the applicant would need to provide uh, they would be responding to that site-specific neighborhood scale um, analysis of, of what types of parking is needed or perhaps not needed. Um, and so this adds um, specific criteria for them and it allows 
the flexibility for the uh, permit granting authority at hand to um, deliberate on it. You know, there there's different theories out there about there's a, a you know form based code. Um, for instance, they suggest get rid of minimum and uh, minimum um, minimum uh, parking space requirements. Um, they also suggest even getting rid of the ratio of parking space requirements. Um, I think that this proposal speaks to sort of this minimum maximum uh, parking ratios that you often read in articles, but it adds uh, a, a slightly more, um, it adds more flexibility for the board at hand. Um, so, so, mm -hmm. so, so if I was building a townhouse I would still requ be required two parking spaces per unit. If I was doing a converted dwelling for a couple of units, I would still have the requirement. Currently. Um, yeah. But, so, so but, why, well, why? I, I would add that, you know, we are but, gonna be lo looking at converted dwellings soon. So, you know, I think that as, as the planning department is going to con continue with zoning amendments, either this year or in the future years, uh, I think that it's important to, you know, explore, uh, explore uh, and revisit this uh, zoning um, amendment if, if uh, you know, if this passes or whatever, whatever is existing. Um, we just at this time are not going to explore other uses that we're not, um, you know, we're not, we're not focusing on. Thank you, Janet. Janet, we're going to go to Jack and then I'll come back to you. Yeah, I just want to say that um, this is is a um, in, you know a, a good approach uh, developed by you know Chris and the planning department to address you know parking issues, which is is a um, you know uh, it's always a uh, you know subject you know it's always always coming in front of us and. Uh, by each developer and it ranges from we we don't need parking to we we need parking per you know each tenant and so um which so it's like it really does need to be you know evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis i mean we have examples within town that provide the, the apartments like the perry apartments i'm, I'm looking at here that have no parking, that have full occupancy. So people coming into a situation will, will deal with the parking, knowing that is a, a condition of living there. Um, and other developers may want to enhance, you know, you know their, their occupancy by providing, you know, a bunch of parking. And, you know, and that's fine too. But I just think as we go through all these things in the planning board, this makes sense in terms of dealing uh, with the parking situation. I would like <laughs> the town to deal with their parking um, uh, permits that they are allotting now and make it more in par with what UMass long-term parking is. Because uh, uh, my understanding is it's, they're way off kilter. And uh, I think that's the town's giving away uh, a lot with regard to their uh, parking permits. So but anyway, I like this and uh, that's it. Thank you, Jack. I'm gonna remind board and committee members that we're asking questions at this time and de deliberation will come after the hearing closes. Um, back to Janet and then Andrew. Did the planning department do any studies of parking at ADUs, apartments and mixed use buildings. We have 25 apartment complexes. We probably have, I don't know how many actual apartments because we have a lot of six plexes and four plexes. Um, we have eight mixed use buildings that have been permitted. Uh, I think half have been built. Um, and then we have ADUs. Ha has there been any studies? Because the transportation plan does call for revising parking requirements, but based after studies, and we have talked about the need for studies. Um, is there any database that is behind this idea that we can just go? And then the other question is, is 
you know, what are the factors? Are these the only factors that affect parking need of tenants? And what are other, you know, I just, where does that, you know, is there research that it's based on? Cause I could think about five or six other factors. Um, you know, we have in, I only can speak to the, the zoning board of appeals, but you know, the, the zoning board of appeals has um, through extensive requests to, to applicants of, of these sorts of uh, criteria of what's being proposed um, for uh, parking reductions. And so, um, and so that, so the criteria that is listed in tonight's presentation kind of has um, been inspired through the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'll give you two examples. Uh, universe, U Drive South, which is being constructed uh, as, as we speak at the corner of Route 9 and U Drive South, there you go, is a mixed use building with 45, u 45 units. And um, I believe it, it's gonna have an eye doctor uh, office and um, perhaps, and uh, I think it's maybe a thousand square feet of, of uh, for the eye doctor. And I feel like he might even have a second sub retail space. Anyways, those two spaces, uh, um, the retail and the residential, um, they have different peak times. And um, that was a great example of figuring out, oh, um, you know, you made a good argu argument that you are requesting for a parking reduction. And uh, because there are different peaks of you know the types of residents are you know taking the bus because it's right on the bus line, um, and they, they uh, a condition of the permit is that there would have to be specific lease restrictions that some of the tenants would not be allowed to even have a car as a uh, again as a lease restriction, um, and so thinking creatively of 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 whether parking is needed. Another example is the recently approved 40B at 132 Northampton Street. Uh, I believe, I can't recall, 28 units, I believe. Again, that's wa in walking distance to downtown uh, and, and walking distance to bus stops, to universities, to shops, to restaurants. Um, and so they asked, uh, the Applicant Valley uh, CDC asked for a parking reduction. These sorts of uh, criteria um, that is part of this proposal were, were uh, request of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And again, the, the, these types of specific uh, criteria are really are helpful for the planning board um, to utilize and for the zoning board of appeals. Um, and I, I'm, those are just two projects that come to mind and I'm sure we could have a whole laundry list of others. So Northampton Road has very few spaces because people can't afford cars and, and they said that over and over. So the shared parking is part of the parking waiver. Um, and so there, so there is no studies that you've done of mixed use buildings or apartments like actual use and needs by tenants in the dozens of apartments. And so, you know, in terms of mixed use, we, you know, North Square has two spaces per thing, although they're not fully occupied. University Drive South, we don't know if that's gonna work because it's not built. Southeast Street Common, we have less than one space. We don't know if that's gonna work. 462 Main Street got less than two spaces, but they just, now they want more spaces and they're not built. Um, One East Pleasant Street is in a no parking district and, you know, and we know that doesn't work. So I, I just don't, I just don't understand the, the fact basis that you're doing this on and I could think of other factors. And so, and then I don't understand why you're distinguishing, like, I don't know what difference does it make if a tenant is in a converted dwelling, an ADU, an apartment, um, you know, a duplex, what, what difference does it make what their parking needs is just by the house they live in? So, you know, I, I really, I, I know I'm kind of badgering you, but I really think that this is not ready for prime time and that we need to do parking studies. We need to follow a transportation plan. We know that UMass students have a ton of cars. Um, we know that poor people can't afford them. Um, we know that we don't have a, a mass transit system that runs 24, you know, you know, all year round, all over the valley. But I, I just think this is just, I, I just don't know where this came from with the database, it's it, the studies it's based on. Um, Andrew, you had your hand up at one point and then you 
unraised it. Do you have a question? No, I, I don't have a question. I have a comment. I'll save it for later. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Andrew. Um, Dorothy Pam. Okay, so I think my question really has to do with the choice of the word adequate. Um, I think there's been a book written about, on the question of an adequate education and the assumption was that the education was not adequate. And uh, it means it's a very subjective term. It usually means so-so or not good enough. Um, and so in this case, you could say it's a, like a giveaway to the developers. Um, I would be happier with, and this is a, a really coming down from the two spaces, one parking space per unit plus satisfactory parking. Um, because I understand your, your discussion and you've given some good points, uh, Maureen, about reasons why every place is not the same and all the needs are different in different places and it's very you know, site specific, but it used to be two parking spaces per unit. If you say one parking space per unit plus satisfactory, then that still gives you lots and lots of room, but it does say there'll be at least one parking space per unit. And I, I just see that as a good compromise. Okay, thank you, Dorothy. Um, I'm gonna take my opportunity to ask a question. I actually have two. Um, the first one is how does the interplay of the two parking spaces per one family dwelling and adequate parking for an SDU work um, since the SDUs are on a one family dwelling? And then, um, Another question is: We're just—I I just want to confirm that um, that the changes here do not affect anything, apartments and mixed-use buildings in particular built in the BG or BL districts that are within the municipal parking district overlay. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So to start with your second question, um, and. Um, Pam, we could share my screen if you don't mind. Um, oh, maybe I can stop share. We can show you the draft language if you bear with me for a minute. Um, is it? Um, so uh, here is the draft language, um, which is in all districts. Um, it goes on and on and on. Uh, but in essence, um, the municipal, um, Parking would still not be required in the municipal parking district. So um, the proposal, you, you know, um, if these uses are in the municipal parking district, they wouldn't need to provide parking. Um, and um, let's see here. And then how does uh, the proposal interact with the supplemental dwelling ADU proposal um, if, if um, if a homeowner has two cars, for instance, in their driveway, and how would we determine uh, what is adequate for the ADU? Is that your question? Basically, yeah. Like, yeah. is the ADU an additional on top of the two, or could it, it be not? Or I'm trying to figure out how they work together. Yeah, yeah, no, they're good questions. Uh, you know, I'm going to switch over to this because uh, I like bullets. Um, so, um, it would be up to the applicant or, or you know the homeowner so in this case for an adu it's going to be the homeowner is going to provide these types of information to the building commissioner or the zoning board of appeals uh about you know maybe the adu is is a one bedroom adu um that's for grandma and grandma doesn't drive um uh, and um you know and perhaps there's a condition of that approval that says you know upon, you know, a change um, of, you know, ownership, uh, a review of the parking could be required, um, you know, if, um, and I'll, in a, another example, if, 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 um, if, let's see here, if um, the homeowner is in, in close uh, distance to a bus stop, um, and they're trying to um, make an argument or not make an argument, but to provide evidence of of saying, well, this is what we want to propose. Does this work for you? If if there's room in the driveway uh, for one space, and they're um, you know in walking distance to a bus stop, 
um, and um, but it's going to be you know a two bedroom, um, two bedroom uh, two bedroom uh, ADU, um, but they just want to provide one parking spot. You know they would need to make an argument that they're in close proximity to downtown or a bus stop, or the, it would have to be um, a, a tenant lease restriction that's part of the lease itself. Um, and so th those are the sort of um, conversations that would need to be handled um, in trying to figure out what is adequate or satisfactory. Thank you for that. Um, seeing no other hands at this time, there will be a second opportunity for questions. We're going to move to questions from the public. So if you have any questions and you're in the public, please raise your hand at this time. Pam Rooney. Hi, Pam Rooney, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is given out tonight. Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Um, I would second what I've heard a couple people say that it just, it feels like this is incomplete. A lot of work has been done on it, obviously, but it just feels incomplete in that it doesn't, it doesn't give any rationale for, uh, for instance, which types of buildings get two parking spaces and which simply get adequate or hopefully uh, additional uh, language that was offered up as in sufficient. Um, I, I see very little difference between subdividable and convertible dwellings and supplemental dwelling units, for instance, or, or similarly a townhouse versus an apartment. And I think even though we're trying to rush through this and just take care of some of the building types that have been discussed recently and that you're about to vote on, I'm sorry, but it really feels like we should be looking at this comprehensively rather than parsing out just the ones that we're really focusing on, you know, currently. So, um, you know, if someone could explain <laughs> other than, gee, but we just aren't looking at the 7.000 building types yet. We're only looking at the 7.0001 building types. So let's just focus on those tonight. Is there any other reason why we aren't giving more consideration to actual needs? I thought the question of, you know, has anybody gone around to the apartment complexes to actually see what we, what is being used these days, I think would be very, very helpful. And it would just be a much stronger position for the town to take um, in establishing um, uh, standards. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Janet Keller. Um, hi, uh, Janet Keller, uh, 120 Pulpit Hill Road. Um, you've spoken of this as site specific and it occurs to me that it is more situation specific. So my question, one of my questions is, what happens when grandma dies and, um, and uh, the mother, the, the, the child of grandma, her own child or her son or her daughter moves in with a partner um, and then the parking that was provided is no longer adequate. Um, what happens when the eye doctor um, practice becomes wildly successful or he's recruited to go to NIH and um, then uh, a restaurant moves in and um, instead of the small amount of parking that the eye doctor needed, um, you have uh, a much greater call on the, um, so, and why not do, um, a, wait and do uh, something that can be based on um, evidence and analysis and do a comprehensive revision instead of piece by piece? Thank you. Uh, so just to answer that real quickly. So um, all rentals in Amherst have to go through annual, annual uh, rental permit registration, um, which is being done electronically starting this year. And with that, um, 
they uh, the um, the property owner needs to submit a parking plan, um, and so for these by right uses, re residential uses uh, such as um, uh, the NADU that would be by right, they would need to update their parking plan on an annual annual basis, and if that changes. Um, that would um, be sort of a trigger for reanalysis of what the need is uh, about um, special permits or site plan review. Uh, you know, the boards make specific conditions of, of their uh, decisions, um, you know, uh, stating, you know, they'll, they'll shall be, so, you know, you know, 40 parking spaces on site for you know, use A, B, and C, any changes to the parking plan or parking management plan um, uh, shall be uh, reviewed at a public hearing. Uh, you common, we commonly see these sorts of uh, conditions. Um, also a, a tenant, uh, this, um, another condition commonly used by the Zoning Board of Appeals is uh, approval, uh, uh, is conditioning, um, uh, uh, leases. And so as we mentioned, um, tenant lease restrictions, that would specifically be part of the lease. And so again, any changes to the lease would require a review and approval of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and so again, same with shared and lease parking. Um, those sorts of things would be part of a permit um, by the ZBA or the special or the planning board. Um, and the, that specific um, these spe specific items, even the traffic Im impact report, that would be a condition of, of the approval. Um, usually, if you look at a ZBA special permit decision, usually the first condition is always the same, which is approval of this decision, um, is approval uh, that this development needs to be constructed in accordance to um, uh, the approved documents and I actually list them um, and, and then it says any uh, changes to these documents shall be reviewed and approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, so th um, this type of criteria uh, again would be would be part of the decision uh, part of the recorded dis decision that's recorded with the Hampshire um, County Registry of Deeds and so um, it would carry with the land um, and um, so a future owner would need to comply with it as well. Um, Thank you, Maureen. Um, seeing no other questions, we will move to public speaking in favor of the revision. If you would like to speak in favor of the revision, please raise your hand at this time. Seeing none, if you would like to speak in opposition to the revision, please raise your hand at this time. Pam Rooney. Um, you're gonna have to, there, there you go. Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. I am not, I am not in favor of this proposed amendment. I think it needs some more work. A lot's been done on it, but I think it needs a lot more work. And I'd like to see a much more thorough um, comparison of the different building structures or dwelling types with each other and, and have uh, a more adequate distribution of parking requirement, not just because we are happening to be working on apartments, mixed use and supplemental dwelling units tonight. So I would highly recommend that this thing get tabled and that, that people come back with some more information on it. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, Janet Keller. I also am not in favor until and if we have more analyses that um, with examples from other jurisdictions um, and uh, I am very worried about the impact in the larger buildings, but also the smaller buildings and um, 
Yes, I, I think it needs a lot more work. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, we are going to move on to, is there any further comment from the planning department before we ask for more questions, see if there's more questions from the boards and committees? Um, seeing no hands from the planning department, Chris. Thank you. I just wanted to say that um, the last two big um, planning reviews of 462 Main Street and um, the Southeast Street Commons um, had extensive discussion about parking. And there was a requirement, there's a requirement in the bylaw for two parking spaces per dwelling unit. And the parking discussion revolved around the issues that are um, being proposed to be added to the bylaw. Um, all of those things were discussed and there may have been other things that were discussed as well. Um, both Janet McGowan and the applicant um, did studies of uh, various developments around town and carefully um, noted how many people lived in different buildings and how many parking spaces were used at different times. But what it all uh, came down to was the criteria that are listed in the um, proposed parking uh, bylaw amendment that is being uh, put before you tonight. So um, however you slice it, these are the things that the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals look at when they're trying to decide whether they're going to grant a waiver under Section 7.9 or not. Um, so I just wanted to say that. I also wanted to say that we haven't yet looked at Janet's proposed language, and she is proposing instead of um, adopting the zoning amendment that um, is being put forward uh, tonight by the Planning Department, um, she's proposing to alter the language of section 7.9. And when we showed that language before, we didn't show the language that Janet was proposing. So I think um, in the spirit that Mandy Jo had with regard to Janet's other amendment, it might be a good idea to look at Janet's proposed language tonight, just so that you know the public has seen it, public has a chance to comment on it, maybe Janet wants to present it and then, um, uh, in, in my mind, it may actually require a separate zoning amendment because it's um, a different section of the, of the section of, on parking. But um, in any event, it may be worthwhile just to look at that language and for people to comment on it if they wish to. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, we're going to move to questions from board or committee. I will go to Janet first because she did not bring up a potential for an amendment during the first set. Um, so I don't know where she's thinking. We can put that potential amendment on the screen, um, being mindful that it might not even be able to be done without a, holding a second public hearing because it might not fall under adequate notice for what we notice, notice today. Janet, would you like that put on the screen? Thank you. So I, I know everybody uh, looks- tired. Can you hold on a second so we can get Pam putting the actual, I think it's the end of page two where the red is. Yes. Um, I will take out the word conclusively. I was feeling a little impassioned. I know everybody's really tired, but so instead of having this zoning amendment with the word adequate that nobody else is using, and we go case by case and you know we, we are kind of a random grab bag of criteria, I, you know, I, I just, I was, I was thinking, my question was, why can't we just alter the current waiver requirements to get where we need to go? And, you know, the waiver requirements, continue, they, except for the first one, they focus on the needs of tenants. So if the tenants don't need parking, you know, if, if the day users and the night users can use the same space, then the, the need for the tenants is met, right? So that would be, you know, 7.910 peak parking needs are generated by on-site uses. Um, it, you know, the next one is a significant number of employees, tenants um, are sharing spaces you know, through some shared parking agreement, that's fantastic. And so the, the third exemption focuses in my view on the needs of tenants. I don't think it meets the needs of tenants to say by lease, you can't park here or you can't have a parking spot 
it's just that focuses on the needs of the um, the owners of the properties to maximize their profit and provide as few services as possible. And so I really, I would not include that in there, but I, I pulled some of this language from other, um, other parking things like in Somerville, they have a guaranteed ride home because they have some parking districts, you know, that are like by T stops, but the T stops at one, right? And so, you know, they can cut the spaces down as long as there is a plan for getting people home, shared parking, year round public transit use. We don't have a transit system like that. It sort of shuts down in the summer and then Christmas. Um, and I would be happy to add other things, but I think we should work in this framework and it's much more clear. Um, you know, you start out with two spaces, you know, maybe we could add bedroom count. So if you have a high bedroom count or, you know, it's a studio versus a five, four bedroom, you know, whatever, you know, you could even say something about students. We all know students have more cars probably than the average person per capita. We heard that testimony a few weeks ago in the planning um, board hearing or our, our thing. The other thing is, is that please don't think that me walking around on two Sunday mornings near 462 Main Street is a parking study, but I did find most of the places I looked at, the parking lots were full and most of those places had two parking spaces per unit. Mr. Oblaski went to some other places on a Tuesday morning and he found some things full like Salem Place filled with undergraduates, some things less full and an average at 70%. Those are not studies, Those are that's data, but that's not a study. And it's not that hard to do a study, not that complicated, but please don't rely on Janet McGowan on two Sunday mornings or Mr. Oblaski on two Tuesday mornings. I do think we need to do this a little more comprehensively and follow the transportation plan, do a study. It's not that hard, you know, there's ways to do it, but I think we should work inside the bylaw and not add confusion with competing this and that and the other. So that's my pitch. Um, I just don't think this is ready to go to town council and I think we should work on it more. Thank you, Janet. We're going to move on to questions from the board and committee. And again, I wanna to stick to questions on the original proposal or the potential modification since we don't know whether it would require a new um, hearing or not, but please stick to questions and not deliberations. We will go to Jack. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I, Steve Shriver uh, chaired the board, you know, not too long ago, <laughs> and, uh, and he's very on top of things, but, you know, we know that the way people get around, you know, this day and age is a lot different than when these bylaws, you know, the original bylaws were written, what, 40 years ago. <clears throat> you know, we have Uber, um, you know, people really, you know, like biking and things like that. But the thing is, you know, if you are, are going into an apartment or a, a dwelling, whatever, a condo, you'll know what the situation is and you will adapt. And I see that happening, you know, throughout Amherst. So this, this parking thing, I believe is like adapting to what the individual, um, you know, developments um, provide and the, the tenants will know that beforehand and they, and they will make arrangements. And um, so, you know, the, 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 the draconian sort of situation where you had two parking places, you know, for, for each unit was this, it was, it was, it was a nightmare. It was, it, it was a train wreck. And I'm glad that the town is addressing it in this manner to make it just practical because that's what we need to be uh, uh, as a, as a town. Um, but I, 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 we need to be forward looking is all I'm saying. And, and I, you know, I see that we have 100% occupancy in, in dwellings that provide no parking. And, and then we also have developers that want to provide a lot of parking more than, than, you know, the, the, you know, two spots per unit. I mean, they want to give it, you know, one per tenant. And so I, I think it's incumbent on the on the developer to under, you know to have that agreement with with the tenant um, and what they need. And I, I believe this 
provides that flexibility. That's why I like it. Thank you, Jack. Shalini, you had your hand up, but then you unraised it. Shalini. Yeah, I can. Um, so maybe it's just late in the night, but I mean, I, I think I get a sense of why this is being proposed given um, that we have limited spaces in certain parts like downtown and we want to maximize the use of that for providing housing and or retail or whatever and then given the long-term future we have a parking garage so we could but i still want to hear from the park uh, from the parking department planning department uh what 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 is the reasoning they pro that they are providing for making this change right now at this point of time just want to hear it again why are we doing this. Thank you, Maureen. Sure. Or, uh, I think it was just to provide uh, more clarification uh, for uh, the boards uh, and the applicant uh, to um, determine what factors, specific factors that need, would need to be submitted, reviewed, and evaluated by the permit granting authority. Um, as Chris, uh, Chris Brestrup had mentioned, um, you know, it seems like it, it, um, these having these specific factors could have been helpful in, in um, previous public hearing processes. Uh, and so we, we want to provide better guidance uh, for the, the, the permit granting authority. And, and you do make a good note about, um, you know, the town, uh, I believe there's two town councilors that are proposing a uh, a zoning amendment change uh, to accommodate a garage behind uh, the CVS, um, you know, and so that that will add quite a few parking spaces in downtown. Um, and there are, are other specific recommendations from the par downtown parking study that came out in 2019, which um, gets into thinking about, you know, providing uh, more, you know, public uh, public parking spaces for so people can park and they park and go for the day of you know you go to the library you go to the coffee shop you ho hopefully are checking out some downtown shops um, but it also some um, a lot of the other recommendations in the parking study gets into um, uh, reevalu reevaluating the uh, the park, the downtown, the town center permit program. And I believe that our finance director, Sean Mangano is looking into that. And um, you know, what, what's the pricing is, is I think it's, is it $25 a year? Is, is that appropriate in 2021, $25? Um, you know, it should parking permits uh, in the downtown be for Amherst residents or should be a free for all, uh, which um, seems like it might, could be buttoned up a little bit more um, to provide, uh, you know, when when you increase the price of, of parking permits, just when you find that sweet spot, uh, I read this in a, a textbook on form voice codes, is that um, it it provides it fill um, parking spaces will be filled, but um, on street parking spaces will be filled, but be, but it will allow just enough available spots per block. Um, and so it, I think it's important to look at the, the, what is that sweet spot for the pricing of par parking permits. Other recommendations uh, that I think the town should explore is, you know, better is, is, is wayfinding signs, which we are, um, but specifically geared towards parking. You, you know, if you've been through downtown Northampton, you'll, you'll see that there um, are these sort of smart, uh, smart um, technology signs for the public parking spaces that will tell you just how many how many available parking spaces are available, um, and and matters like that um, are uh, other ways to improve um, the parking in, in downtown specifically in in the greater downtown area. Nate has his hand up. Mandy, you're muted. I don't know if you know that. 
Oh, sorry. I was the one that was muted. Nate. So I just wanted to prove to everyone that I'm not asleep. The, um, but no, I think to Shalini, to your point, I think, you know, the planning staff looked at, um, you know, kind of, uh, the approach that the two parking spaces per unit is not, maybe not relevant or the right benchmark to start from. So, you know, I think, you know, in Janet's proposal, she's still starting with two parking spaces, but trying to add to the waiver requirement, we were approaching in a different way, not having the two space requirement, but then listing the information needed to make a judgment on what is the right amount of parking. And so we're not waiving the parking requirement by saying adequate parking. We're still expecting an applicant to provide information on what they think the parking is needed to make the development successful. And some of it is the two parking spaces takes up a lot of land and may not be necessary. So do we want to see a asphalt? Um, is it prohibiting development? Is it unnecessary? Because there's other ways to accommodate parking, you know, shared parking. We want to encourage different uses. Maybe, maybe we don't want two parking spaces per unit, even if it's needed, because we want to encourage different types of behavior. Um, and so I think, you know, that's where I was, you know, where I think it's coming from. It's also the apartments and uh, mixed use buildings are the ones that provide uh, many units. And so that also has an impact in terms of how many parking spaces. You know, a single family use, a converted dwelling, oftentimes there's a driveway to those uh, houses that the driveway in itself provides the parking. And then an accessory dwelling unit, uh, the parking may be, um, can be stacked within the existing driveway or paved area. And so it's not a, it's an incremental change. You know, it's an accessory dwelling unit. It's not, you know, creating a parking lot in a, in, you know, a, like a multi-space parking lot. And so for that use, that's why adequate parking could be um, the standard because it's something that the building commissioner would use and say, okay, what is the existing pavement provided at the, you know, the primary structure and is the accessory dwelling unit actually adding that much parking? Um, so, you know, maybe the, you know, the adequacy or the, the definition or right, what does that mean? I think is really the question. Um, you know, is there a better term? You know, is there a better parking ratio? So I think, you know, the staff's discussed that we haven't done some of the data uh, dive that Janice mentioned. My thought is that a lot of times this is the crux of, a, of discussions with permitting. And some of it is people trying to waive the two spaces. And in the previous developments, if two spaces were the, um, the standard, well, on the older apartments, it's always gonna be two spaces per unit because that's what was required. And so I feel like the data can be skewed a little bit and I think it's hard to determine you know, what is the, um, you know, what is the right ratio? That's why we didn't propose it. We said adequate parking and we really want the developer and applicant to show what is needed. And so maybe that, you know, that phrase is a, is a little uh, ambiguous, but um, you know, that was the idea is that they're still going to need to show something, you know, a traffic report studies, um, you know, and then the language there is to also empower the permit granting authority to ask for information, you know, look at the parking counts of the neighboring buildings, uh, provide the downtown permits uh, if it's in downtown. And so, you know, it's just, it's providing those parameters to actually ask for information from an applicant. Thank you, Nate. Andrew. Thanks. Um, I think, you know, when we talk about that adequate language, I think what Janet has here actually satisfies some of my concerns around it. I think, you know, the and to your point, Nate, like I think what you just described, um, this new language, the permit applicant conclusively demonstrates that the parking needs of current and future tenants will be provided by the property owner. Um, it seems like a pretty, a pretty good way of addressing that concern around the term adequacy, as well as making sure that we're, um, we're, we're still addressing the needs. Um, the point I, I wanted to make, um, is just that I think the, the sort of list of criteria we could think of or consider, um, it may seem like it's useful in us reaching a decision, but I'm, I'm worried that it's maybe not. Like I'd, I'd rather see a little bit more of a framework in place, something that would say, um, you know, not only these are the things you could, you could consider, but how we might want to consider it. And, and I understand it's important. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. I understand that like you don't want to be too prescriptive, but you could look at this and say, you know, I'm close to downtown. I don't need any parking, right? 
but maybe that's on Route 9 and there's no on-street parking available. Like you could take multiple, you could take individual criteria here and make a case in either direction. So it'd be useful if we could establish some sort of framework that would allow us to make a consistent evaluation of, of a proposal. So I, I, I like the points that are on here, but I think that without more of that framework, it's gonna be hard for us to really leverage in a consistent way, which is which is my biggest concern is like everything becomes an exception. So thanks. Um Dorothy. Okay, I, I really just would like to um, warn against using the proposed parking garage as an excuse for ever more developers to provide no or little parking. By the time that or another parking structure gets built, if one does, if people keep doing that, it will not be able to do what its purpose is, which is to cure a perception and a re reality of limited parking and a perception, particularly by people coming into town to go to the movies or to shop or whatever, that they, that they won't find parking. So I, I think we can't just put it all on this garage, which may or may not be built because by the time it's built, it can't do that job. So um, I think we also have to remember that if you really are serious in saying that we're not just building dorms for UMass students downtown, then you have to accommodate people who are not UMass students, which could include senior citizens, families, people with children who need cars. This is New England, there's winter time, and um, they don't have the option of going to UMass and paying for one of the spots in their beautifully solar canopied lots. So we can't have it always at once. And so I'm asking for a little bit more consistency and which is to say you want your um, flexibility, great, but then say one parking place per unit and then list all these flexible options that you have been, been mentioning. Um, that, is, that is my recommendation for trying to be able to move forward in a flexible way and dealing with a variety of, of people's needs. Thank you, Dorothy. Janet? So I, I just want to make a plea on behalf of tenants. It's been a long time since I was a tenant, um, but my my kids' friends were renting houses in Amherst, and my son's my son is renting a, a heap of you know wood up in Vermont as a, as a law student now, for a very high price. And so there's very low vacancy rate in Amherst. People there's you know people are paying students are paying very high rents, often for conditions that I wouldn't live in new development is coming in at sort of astonishing prices. I don't think it's a burden to put on property owners and landlords to say, provide sufficient parking. Um, and what happens to the person who signs the lease because they're 19 or 20 or 23 and they sign the thing, oh, I don't need a parking. I don't need a parking space because I don't have a car. Well, what happens when they have a, they get a job, they need a car and they can't take the, um, you know, the PVTA to it. And so do they have to break their lease? You break a lease, you're on the hook for the rent, and then you have to go find it in another apartment. What is wrong with just making sure that the landlords building properties provide cars? We, we've done that in 25 part apartment complexes in Amherst. It might be a sea of parking, of parking things. There's a, there's a sea of cars on them. If we wanna change the world, I don't think we change it by taking away something that someone needs. Um, so I really just think it's like, I, I think it's a help to the tenants um, to, to think about their point of view, not just, you know, I mean, I, you know, I understand the urge to say, oh, we all don't need a car. I think everybody in this conversation has at least one car, um, you know, and I just don't see a lot of people biking by in the winter commuting and thank God for that, you know, in terms of safety. But I, I just think that what we're asking property owners is to provide for the needs of the, the tenants. And I, I do understand like if people are driving fewer cars, but we actually have more cars registered in Amherst, 2000 more than we did 10 years ago. Bus ridership has been dropping by four or 5% a year. You know, the, MB, the, the PVTA has been cutting routes. And so that world doesn't exist. Um, so let's just help tenants out a little and not put all the burdens on them. Thank you, Janet. Evan. Um, yeah, so I do have one quick question, although I, I do just want to make sure I say as the only renter who is in this room right now and the only renter on the council, oh, sorry, Maureen, the only renter on the council, I was thinking of decision makers. Um, 
I don't I don't think it's fair to use tenants as an excuse for this because as someone who continues to run an Amherst, Mar Amherst market, uh, when you have a car, you look for places that have parking. And when you don't have a car, you accept places that don't have parking. And if you get a place that doesn't have parking and then you decide to buy a car, well, you're an adult and you made a bad decision. But I don't, I don't think that we can make that excuse. But as someone who lived here for the first three years without a car, it was actually great when places didn't have parking because that sort of in a very competitive market gave me a leg up on other uh, potential applicants who did have cars who maybe wouldn't be able to consider that. Um, but I, 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 don't, I don't really accept a plea for tenants in, in this. Um, but my question, to get back to my question, is actually, um, I just want to make sure I get a clarification on this, uh, because to some extent we have two proposals that we're looking at right now. Uh, one that was actually noticed and one that we got about three hours before the meeting. Um, to me, the main difference is both of them could allow us uh, could allow a developer to have fewer than two parking spaces per unit in an apartment, but one requires them to have to get a special permit in order to do so, and the other allows it to be more of a conversation between the planning board and the developer, but they don't have to get a special permit in order to reduce that parking. Is that a correct interpretation? I want to make sure I'm understanding this. Uh, correct. So if the use is by right or by site plan review, um, uh, for the planning department's proposal, um, the buy right use would um, would need to demonstrate what is adequate, and they would have that conversation with the building commissioner. Um, same is true for uh, a site plan review uh, through the planning board. Um, but if the buy right use or the use allowed by site plan review needed to ask for a a reduction of parking under um, Janet's proposal, they would need to ask for a special permit um, under uh, section 9.7.9. Thank you. So, Chris? so, so the, uh, the planning department's proposal adds um, flexibility and is less uh, arduous in, in that it's just another permit that would be needed which adds is added cost and uh, and the like it and it, there's you know it can be up to three months um, you know is a typical sort of time range um, for for going through the ZBA for instance uh, for a special permit. Thank you, Chris Prestrup. So I'm not reading um, the existing language that way, and if Rob is here, he could correct me. But I think it is up to the permit granting board or special permit granting authority. In other oh. words, it's up to the planning board or the zoning board of appeals to uh, decide whether they're gonna grant this waiver um, under section 7.9 or not. And I believe it would still be up to those two groups, planning board or ZBA, depending on whichever one is acting in the, in the particular instance to um, be able to grant the um, waiver. Now, in the case of accessory dwelling units, the way we have it set up, um, neither the planning board nor the ZBA is necessarily involved in the determination about whether something's going to be approved or not. So um, they would probably then need to go to the planning board or the zoning board of appeals to get a, um, a waiver on the parking requirement um, in order to, uh, well, yeah. I'll stop there. But I, if I could just follow up. Yes. But under the my understanding of the planning department's proposal is that a waiver would not be necessary for apartments mixed use and, and as supplemental dwelling units. Correct. That is correct. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Waiver not would not be required because you would um, provide information that would satisfy those criteria, and then the board would decide. Did you satisfy those criteria? or the building commissioner would decide, did you satisfy those criteria? So a waiver would not be required. Thank you. Good. Janet, do you have a question? So I've, I've been on the planning board for two years. I've never seen a permit come through that wasn't um, in the site plan review plus special permit. So I don't know if that, I mean, and I don't think that the special permit requirements like add time or are more burdensome. So Chris, have there been any things in front of the planning board that have just been site plan review without, I mean, isn't that sort of uncommon? And then, 
the other thing is we could add the building commissioner into the revision of the waiver. So I mean, everything has a special doesn't Can I answer it? that? Um, yeah. It is true that most site plan reviews, especially for large developments, do require some sort of special permit, but it's not necessarily always true. And at this late hour, I can't think of any exceptions. Thank you. Um, at this point, are there any other questions or are we ready to entertain a motion from the planning board? Janet, you still have your hand up. Do you have more questions? Jack. Jack, you're muted. You are still muted, Jack. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I would move to, um, you know, accept this uh, uh, article. We're, we're dealing with here closing or continuing a hearing. I would uh, close the hearing then. Sorry, it's late in the night. I'm a little. Uh. Yep. <laughs> so the motion from Jack is to close the public hearing. Is there a second from a planning board member? Second. Johan? Tom, that was Tom, I think. Doug. Oh, it was Doug. Doug, sorry. I only get half the half the pictures and I don't know your voices yet. Um, any discussion on the motion to close the hearing? Jack, your hand is still up. It is now down. Seeing no discussion, we're going to start in the middle of my list right now. Up, oh, Janet. So I'm ready for this hearing to close because I'm exhausted, but I just feel like this one is, this, this amendment is not supported by data. It's not well drafted. I think there's a good option. I think there's probably more back and forth. Um, it has showed up very late, you know, in the last few weeks. And so I feel sort of this dilemma, like part of me is like, oh, let's close the public hearing. On the other hand is like, I don't think we have a good zoning amendment here. And so I'm sort of on that dilemma. So I would love to keep this hearing open and move it to like two months from now or a month from now when we have a better draft to show the public and get their points of view. Thank you. Any other discussion from the planning board? Johanna. Um, I feel like we've had a really good discussion tonight. I personally feel pretty satisfied with the answers that the staff have given for the rationale of how this is constructed. So um, I'm comfortable closing the hearing now. Doug? Yeah, I, I guess I feel like whether this passes or not, it's not going to really change the way we are, way we deliberate on projects because we're already taking all these considerations into account. And, and uh, I guess I've, I said last week, and I'll say again, um, it feels like this change is more about bringing the zoning bylaw into agreement with how we are actually reviewing projects now. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no more hands on the comments, we will move to a vote on the motion to close the hearing from the planning board. I'll start in the middle of the list. Johanna. Aye. Uh, Andrew. Aye. Tom. Aye. Jack. Aye. Doug. Aye. And Janet. No. It is a five to one with one absent vote. Um, so it passes. Um, is there a motion from the uh, CRC at this point? I will move to close the public hearing. Is there a second? <laughs> well, I will second it um, to move things along. Is there any discussion from CRC members on the motion to close the hearing? Seeing none, we will vote. We start, I believe, with Evan. Aye. 
Uh, Shalini. Yes. Mandy is a yes, and Dorothy. No. That is three to one with one absent. And so that motion passes too. Um, at this point, we have made it through all the hearings. Um, CRC has nothing left on its agenda um, for the night. And um, I will make the announcement for those attendees that are still here that CRC will not take up these recommend deliberation on the recommendations until the planning board has voted on its recommendations. So I can't give a date as to when that deliberation will take place. Um, Jack, do you have any idea when the deliberations might show up on the planning board agendas? I, I um, Chris Brestrup provided us uh, several dates, oh, August 18th and September 29th. Um, so I would defer to her whether uh, and then the, we have some in, in between dates, I believe August 25th and 8th and uh, September 22nd that are regularly, uh, you know, scheduled meetings that could also be uh, utilized. But um, so that will be determined sooner. Um, Janet raised her hand. Um, I would just beg that we never consider four zoning amendments in a night again this is grueling and I just I'm exhausted I don't I would I would hope that we would stretch it out a little bit more I think that request is probably well taken from everyone at this point so thank you for making that um we will... I, I would prefer not to make a decision about when to do this right now because I have a schedule for the planning board in front of me but planning board has um, things on its agenda going forward. So I think what I'd like to do is send out an email tomorrow to planning board members and give them some choices and maybe even break these things up a bit, like have two on one night and two on another night. Um, but right yep. now I'm not thinking clearly enough to um, make a good suggestion. No, that makes a lot of sense. I didn't know whether there was any tentative plan. So that, that will be announced as as the decisions are made there. Um, with that, I'm gonna pass this over to Jack after, um, I guess, adjourning the CRC meeting at 11.27 p.m. and Jack will do what he needs to do for the rest of the planning board meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mandy. You, yeah. <laughs> Great job. Thank you guys all for hanging with us the whole time. May I make a suggestion, Jack? Yes. That we cut to the chase and just go to the report of staff and report of chair. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't know that anything <laughs> uh, is significant though. So I have nothing and uh, report of staff. Yeah, I do have something um, on the um, 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street. Um, the applicant has submitted a preliminary subdivision plan and um, what that means is that um, he's essentially proposing to freeze the zoning on that property as of July 12th. And if he follows through with a definitive subdivision plan and then definitive subdivision plan would have to be um, accepted by the planning board, then um, potentially the zoning is frozen on the property. Um, so we have received the plan, we've received the application, we received it the day of the vote on inclusionary zoning and um, the moratorium. Um, and right now we're looking at uh, some public potential public hearing dates. Um, so I will be reporting on this in the future. It's sort of an evolving topic, but I just wanted to let you know that that subdivision preliminary subdivision plan had been filed. And um, I understand that the applicant is, is willing to go along with the inclusionary zoning that's been passed, but it may have implications for whether or not he needs to comply with um, the mixed use building standards. So just keep that in mind. And we'll probably talk about that a little more next week when we meet about the um, 11 East Pleasant project. Definitely, definitely a little bit more, Chris. <laughs> So I, I'm re I'm ready to adjourn with that. Um, wow, this is this might be a record for us. Um, yeah, five, five hours. So um, motion to go to sleep. 
You're right. <laughs> Uh, I love it. Anyway, <laughs> here we are. All right. Um, so we adjourn and it looks like we have, you know, some uh, deliberation on, on all these, you know, four zoning articles that we uh, have gone through. Mm -hmm. At some point we'll fit it in. <laughs> so just let us know, Chris, yeah. uh, tomorrow. I'll email you some potential dates next, uh, tomorrow or by okay. the end of the week anyway. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Public. Good night.